and welcome to El Oso Fumar Takes. This is our 148th take, live from the HF Barcelona studios of Euless, Texas. I'm your host, Barry Duplissy, as always, and I'm so proud, so pleased, and so privileged to be with you all tonight. This is going to be an amazing show. It'll be a little bit of deja vu, just a, a little bit of an older version from a couple weeks ago, but we're excited and so thrilled to have our guest of honor tonight, and I am I am as excited as well. You should be excited. Everyone should be excited. I'm going to stop using the word excited, I promise. But before we get to introductions of the guests of honor, we do have to thank the people that make this show possible. And that, of course, is our sponsors. And tonight's show is sponsored by Drew Estate. Drew Estate announced the launch of the Liga Privada Unico Siri Bauhaus, an exclusive release for the European market. The basic tenet of the Bauhaus architectural movement is that every object must have a purpose in design. The new Liga Provada Bauhaus Short Robusto pays extra attention to leaf placement within the cigar, intentionally designed to take or their European aficionados through a newly curated experience. From Sag Harbor, New York, Jonathan Drew, president and founder of Drew Estate, claims today we honor the Bauhaus design theory of form and function and its impact on our mindset when creating beautiful projects such as Liga Provada. Europe. Get ready because I'm I'm talking directly to you. We can't wait to share this mega unique creation with our brothers of Elise from across the pond and beyond. So next time you are able to travel and travel over to Europe, be sure to get a hold of the Liga Provada Unico Siri Bauhaus, the Drew Estate European exclusive. Tonight's show is sponsored by Oveja Negra Brands, four unique companies who share a passion to provide innovative cigars for the next generation of cigar enthusiasts. Black Label, label Trading Company, Black Work Studio, Dissonant, and Emilio are combining premium tobacco with an artisanal touch. Oveja Negra, where art and tobacco collide. Join the flock and visit ovejanegracigars.com to learn more. And welcome to our 148th take. It is my pleasure. It is my privilege. It is my distinct honor to welcome in our guests of honor this evening, sponsored by United Cigars, Smoke Win Today, Start Living United, Mr. Alan Rubin of Alec Bradley Cigars. Alan, how are we doing tonight? Bear, Bear I'm doing great. And uh, I just want to thank you for having me on again. Um, it's been a little bit of time, which is great because we have some stuff, a lot of stuff to catch up on, but it's always great to spend some time with you. So thank you for having me. Oh, it's 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 my pleasure, Alan. This is this really is uh, this really is an honor for me. I I, I felt uh, privileged to have the opportunity to interview you along my part along with my partner Cigar Coop on Cigar Coop Primetime Special Edition uh, for our three year anniversary uh, just earlier this year, which seems like eons ago, right? Um, really you know, does. everything in the COVID era seems like it's uh, <laughs> it's taken on a new uh, a new form and function of time, but it's. Uh, it, it, I, I am blessed and I thank you so much for the opportunity to sit down with you and, and thank you for taking time away from your family. I usually wait till the end of that show. I'll probably say it again, but I, I want to <laughs> thank you for taking time away from your family to sit down with us tonight. It's uh, it's exciting for me. It's, it, it's my honor and pleasure to be here. So, um, well, I mean, speaking of the time of year, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, I'm curious about your, you know, your experience of cigar smoking when it comes to this time of year, the holidays, right? So um, I know you started smoking in your early twenties. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was, I was curious to think that like, did, did you have, and I know you spent a lot of time working closely with your father and uh, your, your late father and everything. And I don't know if there was a memory with him or specific memories around the holidays. I have a couple of smoking uh, cigar holiday traditions, but I wanted to hear if, from your perspective. Yeah. I mean, um, it, it was very interesting because I worked with my dad alongside of my dad for 35 years, first in the business that he had started and I joined in. And then when I started Alec Bradley, he joined me here. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, you'd come to the holidays and there were, there were fathers that were smoking. My father, uh, Ralph Montero's father, George Sosa's father. And actually that was the impetus to come up with a line, our line called Family Blend, was the fact that we, we came up with one cigar that the fathers liked that we agreed upon and the joke was is you could you know you could get any size you want as long as it was it was a 50 by five and a half i mean we only made one <laughs> size in that cigar um but that was really about about family uh which is what the holidays is about right so this is kind of a crazy time right now because there are areas of the country that you know they're they're not allowing family to really be together for the holidays which is very sad so yeah, I mean, um, cigars around the holidays, it's a great time of year being in South Florida. It's cool. You know, it cools down this time of the year. So sitting outside, 
uh, either with my kids, you know, with Alec and Bradley being able to smoke a cigar or spend some time uh, at, you know, a couple of years ago with, with my dad, uh, uh, either in the office or just together, smoking a cigar brings back great memories for me. That's, um, that's really fantastic. I, um, you know, sharing a cigar with my father has never, unfortunately hasn't come to pass. My dad's not a cigar smoker. He uh, smoked cigarettes for years. Um, but he, uh, him and I have never actually in, uh, in, enjoyed uh, smoking a cigar together, but I, I, I have had some unique memories uh, of smoking with, with family on holidays. It's interesting. You mentioned the family blend and I've may have mentioned the story to you in passing before I may, or, or, or the, uh, or your sons. Um, but I, I absolutely love the family blend. I remember it very distinctly, but I remember it distinctly for this story. Um, speaking of family. So um, I, I had started a new job uh, just recently when I got married, um, you know, over a decade ago, it's crazy. And, um, you know, I was spending, because of the, the large commute, I was spending the nights with, at my brother's place, just because again, we didn't have very much money when we were starting out and everything. And so trying to save a nickel here, a dime here, whatever you could. Um, but I, I had secured a couple of family blend cigars and we were going to smoke and, and, uh, um, we just couldn't wait to smoke them. So we lit them up in our car. We were in front of our, we were in front of our house and, um, you know, he had people that he was living with as well. <laughs> and, um, so we, we lit the cigars in front of his house and we were smoking for a few minutes in my car in front of his house. And then we made our way to the back porch of the house that he was living in. And then, uh, I don't know, we're there 15, 20 minutes, whatever, smoking, just talking, whatever. And, um, all of a sudden the person he lives with comes banging out the back door. He's like, Hey, are you guys just smoking cigars? <laughs> like, y y y yeah. What, what else would we be smoking? And, and, uh, he's like, man, the cops are here because someone from across the street said that they saw you guys smoking weed <laughs> in the car. And I was like, yeah. Uh, okay. No, we're smoking cigars. Tell him to come back here. I've got one for him. Um, it yeah. was, it was this big to do. And it, cause the, the, the community that was, that it happened in was, you know, it's quiet, like suburban community. And like, apparently that's probably the most rebellious thing that's happened there in like a decade. And so I guess the, the, the police were all over it and the, the kid from across the street was just horrified with the fact that, <laughs> We lit up something in our in our own car, not in front of his house, but in front of in front of ours. So, but uh, but there, <laughs> yeah, there you have. That's my family blend story. I'll t I'll tell you another funny story. Um, so there's a guy that works with me now, Mike Sirota, who's our vice president of sales. But you know, back in the day, he used to be my next door neighbor, and uh, he was in the financial services business, and he moved from South Florida out to Colorado. And so in the winters, I would go to Colorado and. Ultimately, we'd end up visiting them. And I remember it was kind of a warm day in Colorado, in Denver. And we sat outside and, uh, and I, we had just blended the Max blend. And we sat out behind his house and the family was all together. We finished dinner. He, everyone went in and we sat out and smoked a cigar. And I don't know what happened, but I guess the thin air, it was a little bit cool. And... Max at that time when we first blended it was pretty heavy and all of a sudden he started he started sweating profusely <laughs> <laughs> and I could see he was like not doing well yeah, so we fed him some water but years later believe it or not uh, a few years later we went back and uh, he came out to visit me in Colorado uh, out out in one of the resort areas and he said hey why don't we smoke a cigar and we smoked a cigar it was seven below zero. Oh wow and I thought I had this whole thing beat. What I did was I went into our, our, uh, our carport area and that's where the heat from the dryer was. So I said, hey, I'm gonna turn the dryer on and let the heat come out and we'll sit right there and we'll smoke. Uh, we lasted about 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty innovative though. Gotta, gotta hand tried. it to you. We yeah. tried, seven, seven below was too cold. Oh man, yeah, I was, I was gonna say. Um... I've, I've smoked, I've smoked more than a, more than a few times below freezing. I think the, the coldest I've ever gotten is probably, you know, like 20 degrees. And that was, I mean, that was miserable. 
I mean, that was absolutely miserable. So right. no, cool. with no, well, yeah, with no heater. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we've got a couple comments in the chat, Alan, that you're a little hard to hear. So uh, if, you, if you could, if there's a possibility for you to, I can hear you just fine, but I definitely want our audience to be able to hear you uh, as best as possible. So if you can turn it up just a couple of notches, that'd be great. Uh, let, me, let me try and see what happens here. Is that any better? Can we find out if that's any better? Yeah, I got, I mean, I, I, I noticed a little bit of a difference there. So uh, I, I, our audience will definitely let us know. So I, I again, appreciate it there. Okay. Um, but uh, so I think that the, uh, the holiday tradition of smoking cigars, especially with one's own family is, is definitely like a time honored tradition that uh, I'm really, I'm really, it's really cool to, to hear that you did it. I, I, you know, I smoke with my brother and, and, and folks all the time. And, and this is uh this is a great time of year, you know, despite that sometimes depending on where you live, it can be quite cold. Uh, it's a great time of year to, to, to really enjoy, um, really enjoy a cigar with somebody. So um, really wanted to shift into tonight's major point, speaking of, uh, speaking of uh, shifting in different eras and everything. And of course, our major point is always brought to you by Wood Butcher Maine, introducing durable and attractive wooden creations to your kitchen, backyard grill, and home using native Maine wood and other exotic wood species. Wood Butcher Maine's products include butcher blocks, cutting boards, coasters, grill grate cleaners, and in the yellow from our favorite, the red oak cigar asterisk and cocktail coaster, plus many more. The Wood Butcher Maine's team's passion for food, the pine tree state, and craftsmanship of the highest quality show in absolutely every piece. Visit woodbutchermain.com. Yes, that's woodbutchermain.com to explore the current collection. So, Alan, um, be actually, before we start the major point, I did skip over the, the main point uh, that kind of kicks us off tonight. We were talking about our love for this, for our, the leaf and our love for cigars and everything. What what do you have lit up, uh, lit up tonight to, to, kick, uh, to kick off the evening? So I started with, uh, I got here early to the office tonight, so I'm, I'm smoking a uh, La Vega Coyo. Um, that's, <laughs> that's the beginning. I didn't know how long we were going to be together, Bear. So, followed <laughs> followed by Kintsugi, and then uh, Prensado in the Torpedo. Oh, nice! And then, it, then it goes from there, and I may change this up. Uh, and then the uh, the Project Forty Maduro, which is just about to launch. So, really excited about that project. I was. Um, we'll talk about Project Forty here in a moment, but the project for uh, the Project Forty in particular was such a uh, such a you know digression from your like the normal you know what we've what we've come to see out of the alec bradley portfolio and everything and um so, so well received so well received i mean it was um usually when when a company goes away from its i guess its core competency is mm -hmm. a is it, it it can it can be in this case, obviously incredibly successful, or it can really just backfire um, on you. I mean, that's a that's an incredible, incredible dice to roll um, from any, you know, from any, from any perspective, from any industry rather, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, what, uh, I mean, and I, I remember your answer to this question when I asked you before, you know, you, you'd mentioned the word uncomfortable, that you were uncomfortable, um, with uh, with this risk, but you, obviously it, it proved to be worth it. And proved worth it. So I mean, what? I mean, all, I mean, ultimately you have to be incredibly satisfied with the the success of it. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, and it was it. It's definitely outperformed what I thought it would do, but not it. Listen, um, when I said uncomfortable, because I, the truth is, is that you really can't make great strides either personally or professionally staying in your comfort zone. You know, you have to find a way to break out of that. And Project 40 was the opportunity to really take a concept and work with it. Uh, it's gotten high ratings. It's a tough cigar for us right now to keep in stock. Um, it's just, it, it, again, outperforming uh, everything that we hoped it, it would do, it, it outperformed. And then that was the impetus uh, to come out with the, the new Project 40 Maduro. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to confess something here, um, which <laughs> look at the look on your face right now. I'm, I'm ready for it. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to confess something to you right now. So uh, Alec and Bradley have taken a, a major role within the company. Uh, Alec works a, a lot on business development. Bradley works a lot on the creative side on, on new brands and new projects. And um, they came to me and said, 
we, you know, we, we had seen the, the Project 40 blends and we loved them. But I didn't, I got to tell you, I got to be honest. And that is Alec and Bradley and our creative team, Jonathan Lipson, uh, Gianni, Brunetti, they, they put Project 40 Maduro together. You know, we, we knew what the blend was. I just didn't know there was a project yet. And they came out and they did everything together. And then they presented it to me and I was blown away. And, and I'm like, go, you don't need my approval. Just go, go, go do it. And um, Bradley came to me, Bradley came to me about, about a, 10 days ago, maybe two weeks ago. And he said, dad, I just want you to know um, the first two production runs are all sold out based on the samples that we had sent out to the to our uh, our sales team, you know, our territory managers, and they went out and sampled it. And the first two releases, the two first two production runs are sold out. So wow. I had very little to do with it. Um, a little bit, of, you know, caught me by surprise, but that's what I'm hoping that Alec and Bradley do is take the reins and start running with it. And then come to me for that final approval type thing and say, hey, what do you think? The only thing that I did was in some of the artwork, you know, made some changes and, and a couple of things based on, you know, just experience that I had. So it was great, great to see. That that isn't that is incredible, um, and it, it it's really it's really awesome to see. It has to be really awesome. We're going to get into this subject later, mm -hmm. but it has to it has to be awesome to see because I'm a father of sons too, not much younger than yours, obviously. But mm -hmm. it, it it just has to be really awesome to see them not only working alongside you like you did with your own father for years but taking taking ownership of this thing that you built mm -hmm. and and just bringing it to to new and different heights i mean it's I, mean, I just can't imagine what that feeling's like can you can you share yeah um listen don't think that it doesn't have its, its challenges it does uh first of all Alec is a type A personality. Bradley's a type A personality. And you put them in the room together. You know, there's there's going to be some fireworks. We had and fireworks I, a couple weeks ago on the show, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> right. So, so the only thing I said was, is, is while I'm here and able to do this, it's better to have the fireworks now so that I can kind of moderate that or mediate that and let each of you find your exact, you know, your role, but um, they find a way to work together. They find a way to be together. And I think when they finally put something together that they both believe in, the opportunity for success really goes up. And so to me, it's been phenomenal to see them take, take the reins. We did recently have some conversation of which I'm going to get a little bit back, a little bit more involved. So what happens is I've given this year, which is a crazy year, right? With COVID and everything going on. It's been a, it's been a weird year, but I'm going to, in 2021, I'm going to come back um, a little bit more, be more involved in, in some creative stuff, not getting in the way of Alec Bradley, but kind of adding to what the company Alec Bradley is doing. And I, I, I'm excited about that. I'm excited to work alongside of my sons and I, though I've always been, it's more exciting now seeing Alec really push hard on business development and Bradley come up with these amazing creative ideas. I mean, you saw Kintsugi. You saw what that is. That wasn't, that's not even in my realm. But to see this younger mentality, fresh mentality come in and add to our company, it's, it's mind blowing. Absolutely. And speaking of the subject of Kintsugi, like, I, I think, I think why I'm not to sound too, too condescending, why I'm so proud to be a, associated with the industry and so proud of them for this project is for the realization that, that this project represents Kintsugi, the, the, you know, the, the bringing together of a fractured industry, that was kind of the, the, the inspiration, you know, mm -hmm. as, as Bradley's talked about on numerous occasions. And, um, and for him and Alec to, to put this together, um, 
and to have that realization so early in their career. Yeah, they grew up, they grew up with you, they grew up around it, but I, I, I was just, I was just so proud of the project. I mean, even before I even smoked it, I mean, I just was like, this is, this is terrific. This is, this is exactly what the industry needs. Yeah. So what happens is, you know, you have young guys that care, right? So that, that becomes the future of our industry is younger people who care. And there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of young brands, a lot of young brand owners that are out there pushing forward. And it happens to be that both Alec and Bradley fall into that category. So if you think about it, they came out with blind faith. That was their opening. And we could only give them a certain amount, right? We couldn't take away from uh, Alec Bradley's production to, to, to do that. So it was limited. Then they came out with Gatekeeper, which was a home run. I mean, <laughs> that's their first real cigar that had full exposure, full distribution, and it was a home run. And then Kintsugi, I think, even takes that to the next level. And these are young guys. I can tell you, no one knew Alan Rubin smoked, uh, uh, sold a cigar for 10 years. And Alec and Bradley, early in their career, are making headway. So they're way, way past me in, in being in this business. That. That's interesting that, that you just put that in for sure. Cause I know we're going to talk about the beginnings of your career here in a few uh -huh. minutes, but that, that is, that is an interesting observation that they're, they're already kind of making like the literal name for themselves. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's, it's been well documented on a, a bunch of programs and, and including, you know, including mine when I talked to them about it, but uh, you, you, you posed a question to both of them very early on when they were, they were coming into this business that so you have the decision to make, you can, you can be um, Alec and Bradley, your own, you know, identity, or you can be Alan Rubin's sons. It's mm -hmm. up to you. Yeah. And they, they chose the former and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and look what it's become. Yeah. And by the way, though, I posed that question, there are consequences to the answer. Yeah. Good, either way. Good, good and bad. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that is, it means that I have to take everything that, I have built the company Alec Bradley on and say, am I willing to allow them to go do their own thing? So that's, you know, that's not easy, but I believe in them. I see the passion in them. I see them wanting more. And one of the things I did tell them is I said, look, you know, we're coming into 25 years and I've built this foundation. What do you want the next 20, 25 years to be? That's where you have to take it. But it doesn't mean lose perspective of, of Alec Bradley and where we are as a company, right? You can mm. kind of go do your own thing, but you can't leave Alec Bradley back behind. It has to continue to flourish the way it, it has over the last 25 years. So it, it, the onus ends up on them there, not on me. The onus is on them to, be, to find that balance. Uh, absolutely. And I think that that's a, beautiful segue into what tonight's major point is which is what i'm i'm what i'm deeming this is this is bear's term okay the the second era of alec bradley cigars um like i said this is my term and the way i've seen the way i'm observing it this is because um it feels like and this could be because of your son's involvement this could be because of new new uh new cigar releases like the project 40 and the experimentals this could be just because it's that time the time in the industry there's a whole mess of ways that we could go about this but it just seems like alec bradley is not not straying from their core competency but it's going in this new direction the acquisition of Lars tetons as well like it, the alec bradley is going into this this again to newer heights let's just put it that way mm -hmm. a newer direction um, would, would you agree with that or am I, am I just, am, or I'm mis am I missing the point? No, I don't think you're missing the point. I think what happens is I think you're seeing the end result of allowing Alec and Bradley to be who they are. And that is how long can I be the face of the company? How long can I be the one that leads us forward over the next 10 years, we'll say, and then and, and what do I do? If I'm there, it means I'm keeping them down. 
So what happens is you have to decide in some level who's the spotlight. And the spotlight for our company is the Alec Bradley brand. So who supports that? How do we support that? And yet I still want Alec and Bradley to be them. So it's a, it's a strange balancing act, but uh, the reason I'm going to get a little more involved again on the creative side is because Alec and Bradley are kind of doing their thing. And yet Alec Bradley still, I still have creative ideas that I want to bring to the market. I still have blends that I want to bring to the market. That's exciting. <laughs> so it's a, it's, it's kind of a strange, you know, balance and where's the equilibrium of where Alec and Bradley do their thing, but Alec Bradley continues to flourish the way it has over the last X amount of years. And so I can't put it all on them. I can't put every bit of that pressure on them to perform. I have to still be able to, bring Alec Bradley to where I want it to be. I'm not done with my creative side and I'm not done with my blending. So it's a, it's a bit of a struggle on a personal level, but I think the only thing that can come out of it is something great, in my opinion. It, it certainly seems to be headed that direction because with this, this new, this new direction that we've kind of talked about, it, it, it's, it, it's been, so successful like every step like there's been challenges to be sure we, we mm -hmm. we've had conversations about the challenging with the Lars Tetons release and everything like that mm -hmm. but I mean it, it's been successful every step of the way and I, I kind of go back to the linchpin in this new direction at least from again from my perspective this is just me talking but what and I purposely didn't talk about what I was smoking until now because I wanted to mention it but the magic toast mm -hmm. is what I'm smoking right now and this to me this was this was that moment. As I was thinking about the show and thinking about uh, our conversation tonight, I was like, where did this new direction that I have in mind, where did it start? And it started to me, in my mind, it started with Magic Toast. Now, the artwork, very Alec Bradley centric, mm -hmm. you know, very, you know, you know, very in line with the the core competency, the Mundial, the Prinsado, Tempest gorgeous coloring i mean just it's beautiful right but i think it even i think it starts with the name i mean magic toast like just first of all where did the name come from i want to know that i want to know this story second of okay. all um second of all like it, it to before blind faith came around and kind of disrupted my entire psyche of alec bradley mm -hmm. cigars and then project 40 did it again and then lars tetons did it again <laughs> um this 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 wrecked my 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 perception of Alec Bradley. So I, I just kind of want to talk about this for just a moment. Yeah, listen, if this if if Magic Toast kind of kicked you in the face a little bit, like what is this and how did this happen? Well, that that's that's one of the benefits of me. Look, we've had success in the traditional look and style and feel of Alec Bradley. Right, Tempest and Prensado and and uh, Alec Bradley, Connecticut, and and many of those lines. So what happens is you start to follow the trend of what has made you successful, and you continue to bolster that. Okay. But it doesn't mean that I shouldn't have the ability to want to be creative. So what happens is you can be in this box where everything starts to look the same, feel the same, act the same. And all of a sudden you start to get rid of every creative opportunity that you think is in front of you because it doesn't fit in the box. And I didn't want to be that. And I didn't want to do that. And so when we, so magic toast had that happen was uh, Ralph and I were going down to central America. We went to, into Honduras and uh, I'll make the story quick, but we were supposed to go to the factory and it was getting kind of later in the day and the light was going dim and we ended up going to the fields where this tobacco was. And at the end of the day, it, it, what happened was we were lighting up the tobacco. We thought the tobacco was great. And uh, our partner in the factory said like, let's make a toast. And at, what happened was I said, this tobacco is magical. Like it's, there was something about it it was aromatic. It was sweet. It was just something about it at that moment. 
and it ended up being let's make a, a magic toast was the translation. And I didn't forget that. And then that became the magic toast line. But I still wanted to create around the mentality or or what I what I saw in my head. And so the packaging is different, right? I mean, that's what you're really talking about. Mm -hmm. Though it's Alec Bradley centric and it's banned, the box is not, the packaging is not, um, even the blend is not. So yeah, I don't want to just be stuck in this box. I don't want everything to look exactly the same. I don't want, I don't want brothers. I want cousins. I want something to say, oh, that's Alec Bradley, but man, it's a little bit of a departure. And so that's where kind of magic toast came. And then Alec and Bradley being in the business, them doing their own thing. Um, yeah, that's, it's a direction that has happened organically. It's interesting that, um, you know, I, I, I'm always fascinated by cigar names because sometimes the name is already picked out and you build a blend around it. And then sometimes the name comes from inspiration like in, in, this, in stories that you kind of just described a moment ago. And I, and I, I find that, you know, and this is something that I've tried to explain to people outside the industry, you know, when they hear these names or they're like, oh, that's, you know, that's the G word, which I hate, you know, gimmick and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, there's, uh, like, you don't understand. There's, there's a journey that every cigar goes through as it comes to market and and then it becomes part of this bigger story that we're kind of talking about tonight for example uh -huh. um and i think that that's one of the more i think that's one of the more beautiful things and i think it's actually one of the things that doesn't get talked about enough in this industry there's a lot of there's a lot of laughing and there's a lot of you know ribbing and 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 you know when it comes to name naming a cigar and things like that but i don't think anyone really talks about that as the part of the journey that a cigar goes through. They talk about the blend, the nuts and bolts, which I nerd out on just as much as anybody else. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that the all encompassing journey of the cigars creation is something that doesn't necessarily get talked about as much. Do you, how do you, how do you feel about that? Well, so, so, you know, there's, there's, there's always two schools of thought, right? Somebody comes up with a cool name and said, okay, let's blend to that, or let's just come up with a blend and, and put it all together. And we've done that in the past. It has not proven to be successful for us. What's proven to be successful for us is to come up with the blend and then to create a, a product back behind it to be able to bring it to market. So it, you know, it's great to just come up with a name and then you come up with a blend, you put it together and people enjoy it. And, and that could work for many companies. We've, we've, we've proven historically that doesn't work for us. Even in black market, like something like black market, which is a huge seller for us. I trademarked the term black market. I had trademarked it years earlier. And then one day I was smoking a cigar down in Honduras and we were working with Panamanian tobacco and we weren't there for black market. It was just one of our trademarks in kind of our trademark bank. And I turned to Ralph and like, this is black market. He goes, yeah, come on, seriously. We're not here for black market. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know, but I didn't pick it. It's telling me this is black market. It just kind of happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you have, for us, that's where we have our greatest success. Yeah, Jonathan uh, Lipson's in the chat and he mentioned black market a moment ago. And, 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 and I, think that's a, I think that's a pretty valid point because that was kind of, kind of a departure as well. I loved, I loved black park market for what it represented too because I think it was, when you, th and I, I've, I've said this before, I think I have even said this to you in the past. When I think of, when you think of black market, what would a black market cigar could be? Like if you had knew nothing about Alec Bradley, like that, the, the packaging and everything, the way that you guys present the product is exactly what a black market cigar should look like. And, and you know what, I got to tell you something. When I smoked the cigar, and again, we didn't have anything planned, right? There was nothing planned. So when I, when I smoked the cigar, all of a sudden I had started to have these visions in my head of what I wanted it to be and, and, and what was it to me and what was my vision. And that night with terrible internet till four o'clock in the morning, I stayed up and sent pictures to my graphic designer, like 60 emails, you know, from, from like 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. of what I was thinking. And he woke up 
and he called me. He's like, you just sent me 60 emails on the night. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Hey, we have this idea for black market. I smoked the cigar. This is it. And let me tell you what I'm thinking. And then, you know, he's a, to me, he's a creative genius and he took it and kind of ran with it and we played together for a long time. And then we, you know, we brought it to market. So that's how shit happens. You know, you don't know. So. That's incredible. Just getting, getting back to the, this, this new direction of Alec Bradley here, you know, you had mentioned in a previous interview that I, you know, I happened to be a part of uh, with William Cooper, my partner on Cigar Coop Primetime Special Edition. Um, you, the last trade show that we had in 2019, um, you, you, all, you launched the Project 40. The, the acquisition of Lars Tieden had happened uh, earlier in the year. You guys uh, pushed out the releases of that. And it, you know, in, during the course of that interview, the word comfort came up considerably. Um, and so I asked, I asked the, the question, I posed the question, you know, how comfortable were you with this new direct, this new direction? And you very candidly said, not, not very comfortable. <laughs> and, um, you know, hindsight being 2020 and everything and the success that it's brought you and everything, you know, are, are you now more comfortable with shifting the direction and letting this this or, this organic you know philosophy take over or is it still just as challenging as it was you know 18 months ago so let me first start by saying i want to wish william cooper a happy birthday absolutely <laughs> let, me, let me start there because i didn't have a chance to do that and uh i want to i want to wish coop a very happy birthday um yeah am i more comfortable with it i am because alec and bradley have proven not just not to me necessarily because they didn't have to prove to me they had to prove to the market right and but alec and bradley have proved that their direction for the alec and bradley brand is something that people will attach to and so there's a there's a comfort level there we're going to be taking alec bradley to another level and i can uh, you know I, i'm just telling you that Alec Bradley is going to go to another level because I've had this vision and this idea of what I want our brand to be. And I think we've set a really great foundation. So I'm about to even jump further out of my comfort zone. So yeah, I mean, am I more comfortable than I was? Yes, but I'm about to kick it in the ass one more time <laughs> and, uh, and take it to another level. So, and you guys will be seeing that I believe in 2021. You know, you mentioned the word foundation a moment ago, and it's hard to think about, you know, a, a legacy that you've built over the course of a quarter of a century in this business as mm -hmm. being just a foundation. But you're seeing this beyond, you're seeing this beyond 25, you're seeing this beyond, it sounds like it's even seen, seen this beyond your lifetime. Mm -hmm. it, how, how, you know, in, in 25 years, from now, so 50 years of Alec Bradley. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk, we've used the terms Alec Bradley centric and how it's evolving. You know, if you could really play, you know, really pose a, an astronomical guess here. I mean, what do you think Alec Bradley's place in the industry is in 50 years? What do you think it's doing? What is its is is what is the centricity in 50 years? Well, I think you have to, I think for me, the, the beginning is I have to, I have to start by saying, instead of being the owner of the brand, that I have to be the steward of the brand, right? And that is, how am I taking something that I feel I have ownership, ownership of now and become the steward moving it forward? Saying that Alec and Bradley then should be able to take their ideas and move those forward. And what I believe Alec, Alec Bradley will be is a lifestyle brand. I think it will encompass way more than cigars at a time in our future. I'm not saying that other luxury lifestyle products are not in our near future. And I believe that they are. So uh, like I give an example, just, you know, we, we have a, a flask, right? That we're branding Alec Bradley. We have new lighters, you know, there, there's, there's a lot that we're doing to build the Alec Bradley brand. 
so that it becomes maybe more than just a cigar company. And I believe that's very much an Alex vision. And I think Bradley with his creativity, I think that he would follow suit with that. So yeah, 50 years from now, I think Alec Bradley will continue to be an international brand based on cigars, but become way more than that. It's, it's, it's funny that you say this because it, it, I, I was I, I, I wanted to ask Bradley this question and but I just it, it, it's it kind of it, it's it's fitting right now the way that you describe it the way that I know that Bradley just like love him and I bond over food because we have this this you know this love of you know all things you know all things food and and just great chefs and great dishes and, and things like that I could totally see you know, one day, you know, maybe in the, maybe in the distant future, the Bradley opening, like seriously opening up a, 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 you know, a Michelin star restaurant, you know, maybe branded as Alec Bradley, maybe a Alec Bradley lounge to the side or whatever, but I could tot- I could totally see him doing that. And yeah, so, so let me tell you a good story. Um, you know, we just are passing Thanksgiving and Bradley called me up and he said, dad, I think we should make Thanksgiving. And I said, great, let's do that. And he said, yeah, but I don't cook. (laughs) I said, well, I don't either, but let's give it a shot. And, um, (laughs) and we, I called a friend of mine who is a very, very high end chef out in Las Vegas. She's a, you know, she's, she's one of those celebrity chefs been on TV type of thing. And I said, Bradley wants to cook. I don't know what I'm doing. He doesn't know what he's doing. I need some help. And <laughs> guidance, uh, guidance, please. Guidance. Yes. Please. And she sent, okay, you know, you need to get the turkey. She told me where to get it from. We bought this organic turkey and whatever. And then um, I, you know, I, I said, okay, Brad, I'm going to do the brine. And we, you know, I grind the turkey for 48 hours and did all these different things. And Bradley right. came over and we made all these dishes. And it was so exciting to spend that kind of quality time with my son on something he wanted to do. It was phenomenal. Alec, Alec came over, didn't cook one thing, but he opened up a bottle of whiskey, <laughs> which is right up Alec's area. And, and we, we drank whiskey and we made a bunch of dishes and it was spectacular. And I could see Bradley's brain, as you said, Bear, like, who knows what this is going to be next, you know? And I think that's what Alec and Bradley bring to the table that, you know, I'm, I'm very focused on the cigar business and what the cigar business is and where, what's our place within that, in, you know, in this industry. And Alec and Bradley have that same passion, but they also have other passions that I think have come in here. That's awesome. I'm, I, I'm really excited to see, I, I've been excited to see what what they do next, and not not the not in the under the what's new what's new umbrella of just in the cigar context. Um, but I mean, from the moment that I've met them, um, I was I was just I was you know, impre- impressed. Is just kind of it, it it doesn't do it justice. It really doesn't. It, like it it was a different type of impression. Let's just put it that way. That just like. It, you've had this over, you know, uh, years and years of being an employer, you've, you've, you've met those people or you've interviewed those people that have come into your, to the fold and you're just like this guy or this gal that, that there's some, they, whatever that it is, they have it. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's exactly the, that's exactly what I was hit with when I met, when I met your boys. Well, what happens is I think what in the communication between you guys, and I know that you guys have a, a great connection and and I think, what you find is like, it's not like they're verbose and they're just talking about it. You can feel the passion. You can feel the understanding. And, and what happens is I think you attach to like, hey, there's another generation that's coming up that's involved in creative, involved in blending, involved in the next, you know, the next portion of what this industry brings. And I think that's why you guys connect so well, right? Is that you kind of feel what you each do and what you each bring to this industry. I mean, and you and I have talked about it, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's, you know, listen, it's, it's almost 1130 right on the East coast. And I'm sitting here with you because what you bring to the industry is something that's so vitally important. And that is 
you bring a platform there that we all need to be able to tell our story. And so you guys kind of get that together, you and Alec and Bradley. I think you kind of get where you all fit in this project. I certainly hope so. And those are, those are humbling words coming from you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the, the this is a really good place to kind of go with something that I had mentioned a couple of weeks ago when I was interviewing them. And, and, and I, I told you this, this question before we started uh, in the green room and, you know, and I, I said, Hey, I'm going to ask your dad this and I'm not going to, I'm not going to necessarily hedge, hedge the question at all, but I've, I've, I've never, I've never thought of you as, as old. So, and, and, and the reason I'm, I'm prefacing the question this way is because for in my entire smoking career, Alan Rubin has been a part of it. Alan Rubin has been a part of it. Alec Bradley has been a part of it from the moment that I started smoking cigars you were there. And so, and I've been smoking for a very long time, mm -hmm. at least in my mind. I mean, I've been smoking since my 18th birthday. I'm 37. And I, for that entire time, you've always been there. And so, but, but I, there's, there is something new now there that I've, and, and, and again, maybe this is just the fact that I didn't know you. Mm -hmm. Maybe that I didn't have that, that kind of connection or anything in the time. But there is, seems to be this, and I call I coined it the the fountain of youth that you seem to have drank. There's this vibrancy that seems to have been taken over you, and it might be what we've already been have to do with what we've been talking about. And I'll let you elaborate here in a second. But I, if I could just preface it just a little bit more, was there's this vibrancy that I just maybe just didn't recognize that was there before. Maybe it was camouflaged differently. But I wanted to ask you: Do you do you feel? like you've you've gotten this kind of resurgence in 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 recent years a new vitality or is it am, or again am i just missing the point no i i don't think you're missing the point i think there's a, there's a couple of things one is um I, I don't feel old you know i just don't i don't i don't feel like you know i'm i'm at the the you know kind of like over the edge and i'm on the back side and maybe i am but I try and create an atmosphere that I want to work in. We have fun. We laugh. We smile. We get our work done. Um, we take it seriously. And we enjoy being here every day. I mean, one of the things that you could hire the greatest talent in the world, and if they don't fit within your organization, you have nothing. So one is I have great people. Two is they like to laugh like I like, to, you know, like to laugh. And then you have Alec and Bradley. And that, I think that's part of my resurgence is like, Alec is always posing questions to me. Bradley is always posing questions to me. And I have to, I have to be on my game. I don't have time to shit around because they want, they want answers. And in some way, I almost feel a little bit of a challenge from Alec and Bradley. Like, hey, they're doing the Alec and Bradley piece. They're also doing the Alec Bradley piece. But I want to show that I still have it. I want to show that I can still bring Alec Bradley to the next level. And I'm doing that. And so there, there is a resurgence. You know, listen, business has a tendency at times to get old when you've been doing it for 25 years. You, know, you kind of get into a pattern. And when, when Alec and Bradley came in, they didn't give me that chance to like, just kind of ride off into the sunset. They're like, no dad, uh -uh. unless you show me that there's a better way, unless you show me there's more there, we're going to do our thing, but you have to, you know, I have to keep them in line. I have to still allow them to do their thing. And I'm still excited about Alec Bradley itself and that brand. And what are we going to do with it? And where's it going to go? So yeah, there's a resurgence and there's a revitalization. And I'm excited and I'm pumped. So do I want to work, you know, the, the 60, 70 hours I was working? I don't. But do I want to come in and make an impact? I still do. And I think that's what you're seeing is like, I'm, I'm allowing this kind of movement to take place, right? When you're talking about, you know, blind faith and gatekeeper and, and uh, uh, Magic Toast and Project 40. Yeah, I'm not gonna allow myself to just to be cut off because it doesn't fit into the Prensado, Tempest, 
traditional piece. Now, I want to be able to be creative. I want to be excited. And I, I can tell you, Bear, there's so many cool things going on right now. I reconnected with my old creative director, um, a really close friend of mine who uh, is a strategist. You know, we started working with and talking to. I, I, I'm I'm like ready to go. I feel like, by the way, you know, we're about to we're about to celebrate 25 years, Alec Bradley. And I feel like we're about to celebrate five years. You know, I'm like, let's go. And and I'm all about it. I mean, I'm I'm ready. I, I think that excitement is evident. You know, I and and I think it's evident for you know, if anyone just can sit and, and listen to a conversation with you or an interview with you with five minutes into it, you can tell. And that's what I was talking about. Like maybe I just didn't. I just maybe I just didn't have the access before, and I, I remember having this this picture of you in mind, and then it was kind of completely blown. We talked about your your infamous ad, the Texas Line Sarah release, the bikers. Just I just loved, um, and I was like, this this guy is really awesome. I I was like, I hope one day I get to meet him, and here I am. Um, but and then, but then my my first interaction with you, and you don't know this story. My first interaction with you wasn't even an interaction. I, and we actually didn't speak or didn't shake hands, didn't meet. My, where I was in the same, I guess, square footage of you is I was, uh, I was at the trade show a, f a few years ago and I was sitting with Coop and we were interviewing uh, Bill Paley, William Paley of La Polina. And you, you came walking by and you, you sort of like, you know, shouted across the room at, at, at William Paley and said, Hey, you know, look, and it was, you were, I think you guys were comparing the shoes that you guys were wearing at the trade show, like who could have the most comfortable shoes or something like that, or who could have the coolest shoes or whatever. And it was just this, this declaration across entire like show floor of, you know, retailers and tobacconists and uh, media like, and it was, it was, I was like, I, I was sat there and, and, Coop was waiting for me to ask uh, Bill the next question, and I was just kind of taken for the moment. And I just like looked, and and he looks at me, he's like Bear, and I was like, sorry. Um, you know, <laughs> it, but it it kind of it, it again it kind of led me to this 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 kind of discovery of who you are as a person, and 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 this this again this we I keep using the word vitality, this vitality that seems rediscovered, and I think it's again I think it's evident, and I think it's really exciting for anyone who's an Alec Bradley fan. And let's forget, let's not forget the 25 years of amazing consumers that have that have helped you build this brand. Oh yeah, this has to be. I mean, this has to be so exciting for them, um, seeing this kind of this re-resurgence if you will and i and it's and that has to excite you too just from the con, from your 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 fans perspective the consumer perspective yeah i mean as excited as maybe our our advocates are you know our fans are it is way more exciting for me i i can tell you because i love when i get the emails about you know keep doing what you're doing and we love we love alec bradley and all of those things i mean i can tell you Every time I get an email of somebody who has had a great experience, somebody who has shared a, a time with their son or with their father or with their brother, I take that email and I forward it to everybody in our company because I want them to understand that we make a difference, right? And by the way, the thing with Bill Paley, because if you can't have fun and you can't kind of shit around and, and have a good time, what am I doing? If you take yourself so seriously, that you forget to smile and, and laugh and have a good time, you're crazy. Uh, that's not balance in my life. I want to spend time with my wife. I want to spend time with my kids. I want to spend time on the golf course. And I want to kick ass when I get to work. It's a, it's a tough balancing act. But by the way, 20 years ago, I wasn't taking time for me. You know, we talked, you were too handicapped in golf, right? I'm still a double digit. Because in the prime, the, <laughs> in the prime, let's <laughs> be clear. <laughs> but yeah, but but you were. Yeah. But my goal is still, you know, and I'm not far off. My goal is to be a single digit in golf, but it can't get in the way of my excitement for Alec Bradley. 
that comes first because it turns me. It, it excites me. New blends get me nuts, right? When we come up with a blend and we make them adjustments and all of a sudden it's working there, there's nothing better. That's like, that's, that's the pinnacle is to be able to come out and say, we have something. We have something exciting that people are going to love. What do we do with it? So yeah, I want balance in my life. But that doesn't mean me being less excited about here, you know, being here. And the thing about, like you said, I probably screamed it to Bill Kelly across the floor. Just because if you take yourself so seriously, what are you doing? You know, it's like, really, we're at a trade show. We're working our butts off. Everyone's working 18 hours a day. You got to have a little fun. And that's what I do. It, you, uh, you mentioned spending time with your kids, spending time with your wife, time mm -hmm. for yourself. I want to talk about a moment that you actually got to spend with your son, Alec, um, that was work-related. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm, I'm a father of sons too, while they're much, much younger than yours. And, mm -hmm. but so it, it, this was a, this was a moving moment for me as I was, I was kind of, you know, I was watching a video, uh, the whiskey Wednesday video, um, from a couple weeks ago. And, you know, it, it automatically kicked me into, another video that you guys had done uh, three years ago. And it was the unboxing of Blind Faith. It's you and Alec in the warehouse. And, you know, smoking a couple of cigars, you know, lighting them up with your Bic lighter, got the, got the box cutter out. And, you know, you talked about what a moment that was for you, for their mother. And I... Alan, I was, I was, I was touched. Like, I, I mean, as, as cheesy as that sounds, I mean, I was watching a Facebook video, but I mean, I was, I was moved. Um, what, I, <laughs> for you, that had to be, I mean, tell me what that oh, moment yeah. was. So if you think about kind of the world, right. When you think about as you get older, you know, you have kids, Barry, you have two little kids. Right. I mean, and every day your life gets better. Every day they grow up and there's no bad ages. You know, I don't believe in terrible twos and all that crap. It, they just grow into people. And you get to be a part of that. So think about it from my perspective. I get to see Alec and Bradley in their careers every day. Think about how fortunate I am. Think about how lucky I am that I get to see Alec and Bradley in their careers moving forward. I get to be a bit of, you know, a, a little piece of that, like helping guide them, helping them navigate through all the waters of their business. I mean, to see them come up with their own product, take ownership of it, care about it, have sleepless, sleepless nights over it. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's the best of the best. I get to see them hurt. I get to see them figure out what failure looks like in some level, like people want it and I can't get enough product and what do I do? Now, I get to be a part of that there. I mean, I get to be a part of their careers every single day. No one's more blessed than me. And at some level, uh, until, until a couple of years ago when my father had passed, my kids, my dad, myself, we got to be in this room, this office, every single day together. I don't know. I'm... I can't judge whether it's good or bad, but I can tell you from a dad's point of view. Yeah, it's special. It's, it's special. There's just no other way to describe how, how, how it was, it was, it was moving. It really was. It would just to listen. And, and I went back and I watched it a couple of times 
Um, and it was just the the words that came out of your mouth, the the you, you, everything you just said. You could you could feel that, and and I think everything that we've already talked up into now, I think is that 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 moment is a perfect launch pad for this next 25 years that we were talking about just a few moments ago and mm -hmm. it's that was it was it was just it was it was absolutely beautiful so yeah you know it's funny there i actually refer to this time so far as the first 25 that's awesome yeah you know you mentioned your father um who's unfortunately no longer with us and everything. And um, now he, he was around for that moment, right? He was around for the launch of Blind Faith, if I, if I get my timelines correct. Mm -hmm. what, what were the conversations around, around, with him around that? Like, you know, what, was his, what were his thoughts and his, his perspective, if you don't mind sharing? So my, my father was a man of few words. He wasn't one to always come out and talk about his feelings. But my father was funny as shit. He would just say things that you would never expect a guy in his 90s to come out and say, but he's always been that way. And when I showed him the product that his grandsons came out with, literally all he did was kind of shake his head yes. Like, yeah. You could, you could feel the pride. You could feel this generational piece. Like, yeah, those are, those are my grandsons, you know, like following in the footsteps. My father had a work ethic like there was no other. I always joke that. In our old business, it, we opened at 7.30. If I walked in at 7.31, my father would say, good afternoon. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a different generation. Um, yeah, you could feel the pride of my father seeing his grandsons get into the business. Not just the work, but get into the business. Yeah, it was special. That's wonderful. And then I kind of wanted, before we go into our next segment, which we're, um, I, I am teeing you up because uh, last time I said we were having him some fun questions and we had some hard questions. These are actually fun questions, I promise. Okay. I'll give it to you. I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to toast. I know you're drinking something. I'm drinking something. Uh, to, to the first 25 and to the next 25. I'm with Cheers you, Bear. To you. Cheers. Thank you. We'll do it together, Bear. I'm excited for the ride. Absolutely. Um, so as we just toasted, um, this next segment is, our, of course, our One Must Go, which, of course, is always brought to you by United Cigars, featuring La Giana Havana and distributors of Jose Dominguez, Bandolero, Gar Garofalo, and the highly acclaimed Atabay and Byron lines. So smoke one today and start living united so alan you haven't had the uh you haven't had the pleasure of being a part of this segment so uh for the purpose of our audience who may have not have heard this we've had this segment going on for a little over six months now it's been a lot of fun um where the idea of one must go is i pose you a question of three things and one has to go and okay um and i'm actually going to do a little bit of a double dipping tonight because i think i know this is going to suck if I don't know, but I think I know one of the ones that's going to stay, at least one of the ones that's going to stay. But I know that you're a fan of fine spirits, mm -hmm. um, particularly of the whiskey variety. Correct. And so there are a lot of different types of whiskeys and, and, and a lot of whiskey drinking is, you know, is huge in, in, the, in the cigar industry, um, enjoyed by uh, many of our, our comrades and colleagues alike and everything. And so here are your choices. And I'm going to participate with you as well. Okay. I'm not going to put you on the hot seat all by yourself. But again, this is fun, right? So um, so we have, of course, Scotch whiskey. I see a Glenfiddich behind you, a bottle Correct. of that. Uh, you pulled out a bottle of Elijah Craig tonight. So it's also bourbon is the second choice. Correct. And then rye whiskey. 
mm -hmm. which I think is kind of one of the underdogs of the whiskey world. Not many people talk about it. It's not produced very much. It's not, it's not, it's not as much as it doesn't hold as high esteem in pop culture, especially right now as scotch and bourbon, particularly among cigar smokers. You know, the scotch I feel was like the old, the old guard bourbon is kind of becoming the new guard pairing of cigars and everything. But uh, um, before I give away my answer too much, I wanted to hear yours. So scotch, rye and bourbon, one must wow. go. Okay, you didn't make this easy. Um, this isn't so, actually a permanent decision, by the way. Okay, just, good. It, yeah, yeah. So the one for sure that will not go is rye, for sure. Wow, okay. Shocked uh, Shocked already, okay. okay. Okay, so rye will not go. Okay. Um, so I like everything. For me, generally everything over 100 proof is kind of where I live. So I give an example, uh, this old Forrester 150th anniversary proof 126.4. Okay. Elijah Craig 18. Uh, this is also a higher proof, though I don't see what it is right now. But it happens to be that, to me, I like that rye bite. I, I, I like what it would it add? So rye for sure will stay. Generally, even single malt scotch is is a little bit lower proof, and uh, I've kind of been into the higher proof. So right now, uh, this is not going to be popular, but right now I would say scotch goes um, <laughs> rye one, bourbon two, depending, and then maybe scotch even though i mean my favorite scotch without question is lymphatic 15 i think it goes phenomenal with cigars and i've been all over the bourbon scene because of alec and bradley they're both like all you know all about it and then uh rye i've been playing a lot with the mictor's 10 year rye and uh, i'm kind of digging that so yeah rye stays uh, bourbon of the higher proof stays and uh, then probably scotch. <laughs> this is why I would make a lousy attorney because you never ask a question unless you know the answer and clearly my assumptions are getting carried away with me. I know what a, have, what a great affinity you have for Glenn Fittich. So, so I was like, oh, I was like, mm -hmm. oh, he's going to pick scotch. This is so, mm -hmm. this is this. yeah, wow. Um, incredible. Yeah, just not no go away that I thought, but We'll get to that in a second. Um, um, I, I really do think rye is the underdog of whiskeys. It really, it really is. I think there, there, there are a lot of great. I feel like there are a lot of there are a lot of mediocre bourbons, and there are a lot of mediocre scotches out there uh, that exist. I don't feel like there's a lot of mediocre ryes. Um, in fact, I'll be so bold as to say I don't think there is a mediocre rye that I can think of off the top of my head, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm um, with you. Um, that, that being said, for, for my personal taste, I, I think that, um, and it's, it's a close one too, um, but we're gonna, I'm gonna flip two and I'm gonna agree with you. Like bourbon for me is number one. I, 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 like, I like that, that those, the sweetness of the barrel, I like the, sh the sharpness of a higher proof bourbon, um, but I like the sweet undertones of the maple, the vanillas, that, cre that creaminess of some good bourbons, um, you know, rye just in, in rye kind of has that that really that really smooth under you know underbelly, mm -hmm. you know, that really just to me goes incredibly well with cigars. Uh, scotch is kind of scotch is scotch and will always be polarizing. Um, I, I think for you know for, has been and, and forever will be. I think scotch is one of the most polarizing. Well, actually, I think it's one of the most polarizing things ever. Like, like I mean, take spirits out of it. I mean, just in general, scotch is polarizing because there's 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 different types, and then there's peaty, and there's not peaty, and there's people who who like non-peaty, but they can't stand peated scotches, and it's just I mean, it's just all over the place. <laughs> Agreed. Um, so I, I think, and I'm I'm a huge Glenfiddich fan as well. Like I think Glenfiddich is my favorite. Um, I'm a really big fan of the Nadura. Um, 
really like that cold that cold chill filtered uh, scotch. It's 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 fabulous. But scotch for me has to go. I, I, yeah, that was going to be. <laughs> So that that's 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 interesting. I just did not see it going this way. I thought I was like, oh, we're going to disagree. This will be fun. Um, but um, <laughs> that's that's uh, that's an interesting. So. So. OK, so I, I wanted to kind of play off of my assumption that scotch was going to stay. So we'll, we'll have fun since scotch is being fun. left out. We'll have fun with scotch again. So OK, we'll post three more scotches to you. Glenn Fittich, I know, is staying. I know I got this one right. So it's Glenn. For Finich, sure. Yeah, Glenn Fittich is in this list. OK, Glenn Fittich. Okay. The Dalmore. Yes. Depending. And, and McAllen. So as an overall brand, so we're talking Glen mm -hmm. Fittich 15 is your bag. That's it. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of other Glen Fittiches. Right. A lot of McAllen's. There's a lot of the Dalmores, including the cigar malt, which I don't know if you've had the Dalmore cigar malt. I have it here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so which are those three brands all encompassing? Okay. Which one goes? Okay, so let me start by saying that my entree into whiskey was the Dalmore. Um, they came to me many years ago and said, we're launching this uh, Dalmore cigar ball. And can you come up with a cigar? So we actually have a Dalmore cigar that we did for cigar ball that... Uh, <laughs> That, did not know this okay this yes so that was the beginning and i think that dalmore king alexander is a spectacular whiskey um yeah i'm not i think for me mccallan i think that's the one that has to go i think it's overly sweet on the top end and has a little bit very little balance and and then doesn't finish um i think that Glenfiddich 15 and Prensado is like a marriage made in heaven. Um, I think that the Glenfiddich 14, if you're a bourbon drinker, is a, a spectacular kind of segue into scotch. So, yeah, I'm a fan of what they do. And I can tell you right now, if you haven't had the Glenfiddich uh, IPA, that is, that's a mind blowing whiskey. It's that good. Oh, it's fabulous. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So to me, McAllen's on the app. Okay. Terrific. Um, hold on here. Alan, I want to make sure that we are still uh, still live here. I think we lost, lost. I'm showing that we're still on a feed, but I just want to make sure here. Um, um, I'm... We're still going. I, I so I'll, I'll pose the question while I'm trying to reload my page here. Um, wanted to ask you about the the Dalmore cigar that you said. So what what cigar did you did you come up with there? Um, so what happened was we were asked to do a cigar for the Dalmore um, uh, cigar malt, and so we created a special blend just for that whiskey. We've also done that for. Um, we did that for Glenfiddich 21 year old as well, or I'm sorry, 18 year old as well, that they asked us to come out and, uh, and create a special blend for that expression. And, and we did that. So the thing with Dalmore is that I, you know, in, in all honesty, what happened was they brought in a new creative director uh, or marketing or head of marketing. And uh, he wanted to, do some other things and i didn't feel they were the right partner for us anymore and so we uh we departed from the dalmore and ended up with william grant and sons and glenn fiddick and it's been an amazing partnership that's that's awesome i had no idea about that story that's incredible i um so i have a i have a really good friend of mine that i went to college with and he Forever and for always was always the Scotch guy. Um, particularly, he yeah, that was what his father drank, so that's what he decided that he needed to drink. Um, it, not, I'm not trying to be overly insulting of him or anything like that, but that was just kind of his, you know, his segue into spirit drinking and everything. And he um, he um, drinks Macallan exclusively. Um, I mean, almost, almost exclusively for, for, mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes. It's interesting that you mentioned the sweetness that comes with McAllen. 
Um, and so for his birthday a number of years ago, I gave him a bottle of uh, Glen Morangi, um sherry cask because it had that that sweetness about it. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. I was like, this will be totally in his wheelhouse. And he was kind of like, well, he's like, hey, you know, thank you. He's like, you know, I, I'm not sure I'll like it. You know, I'm a McAllen guy. It's like, you're a McAllen guy. Try try this out. Just let me just just humor me, essentially. Um, I bought you a bottle of scotch for your birthday, man. I mean, just come on, humor me. <laughs> um, and um, and he um, he <laughs> he tries it. He loves it. And he's like, how did you do that? I was like, it's the same way, man, that I can give you a cigar and you like it. Yes. And, and this is uh, this, this friend of mine, he's, he's always constantly, uh, his mind is always constantly blown how I can always hand him something that's different from his, because this is a guy who goes to, goes to a restaurant and he orders the same thing every time, you know, and, you know, and so he doesn't depart from, he doesn't depart from his norms. Unless, of course, I'm shoving it down his throat. Um, you know, he smokes. He, he does smoke cigars. He grew up, again, his father, Macanudo smoker. That's what he smokes, right? He drinks McCallum. His dad drank McCallum. That's what he drinks. And and so I'll, I'll give him other scars and I'll give him other scotches, for example. And he's just like, I just don't understand how you do this. I'm like, it's really, it's pretty, it's pretty easy, man. When you understand what you like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, you're a Macanudo smoker. I'm not going to give you a La Florida Minicana or a blind faith, just not going to do it. You know, <laughs> it's just not going to work. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if you play to your strengths and play to your likes, it's, it's. Yeah. You match up sweetness, you know, you match up sweetness with the, with the sherry cask or the Oloroso type cask and, and you go from there. But yeah, I mean, I look, I, I think what happens is I think when people are not open to trying new things, you know, it's almost like take the band off every cigar right? And pour a bottle of whiskey, not knowing what the bottle was and just drink and smoke and see where you end up. I mean, there's, you'd be surprised for sure. Is there any other scotches that you liked that you think pairing, you know, pairing, you mentioned the Glenfiddich um, 15. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there, is there another scotch where you're just like, this is a, maybe the second best to go with the, you know, go with the cigar? Yeah, so I'm not a big PV kind of Isla guy um, because I think that what happens is you have that smoky pv and, and it's tough to pair with the cigar for me. But there are people in my office even that are big PV guys that are uh, like, oh, yeah. Jonathan Lipson, that. right? Yeah. <laughs> That's where I was going. Correct. Um, and so he, he knows how to do that. But, you know, I don't. I think that once the nose is taken over by big PV whiskey, it's hard to find a cigar to pair with it, but everyone's got their thing. Yeah, there's a couple of, of, of Balvenies that I have here. I mean, let me just. So. I love the Balvenie Caribbean cask. That's one of my jams. What do you yeah, got there? So, what do you have so there? Double is, wood? Yeah, so this is the Ton 1509. Okay. So that's a, that's a limited edition piece that, that they do that I think works phenomenal with cigars. It's balanced. It's, it's, it's got the sweetness, but it's really nicely balanced and it opens itself up, opens the palate up to a nice cigar. So I kind of like going there as well. Nice. Well, terrific. Well, that was our, uh, thank you, Alan. That was our one must go segment. And as always, it's always brought to you by United Cigars. Featuring La Giana Havana and distributors of Jose Dominguez, Bandolero, Garofalo, and the highly acclaimed Atabay and Byron lines. So smoke one today and start living united. And never assume, because truly it makes an ass out of you and me, as I did just a moment ago. So <laughs> I thought I had that one nailed, Alan. I, you, took, you, you threw me for a loop there. I, I appreciate it. That's good. <laughs> um. So we wanted to go into another great subject. Uh, so, uh, you know, for, for those who have recently tuned into my show on my birthday, just a couple of months ago, I announced that I was doing this, this new, uh, this uh, new direction. Uh, we've been talking about new, new directions a lot tonight, this new direction with LOS Fumar takes. And I really wanted to find a way to give back uh, and bring attention to passions uh, beyond the cigar industry of my guests. And I thought what better way then bring attention to nonprofits and charities that hold a special place in my guests' hearts. 
And so each week now, uh, for the last few weeks, and today, uh, this week is no different, I've asked my guests to uh, select a nonprofit or charity that they want to focus on, raise awareness for, and raise some money for. Um, and uh, uh, your, your son's had two uh, amazing um amazing choices a couple of weeks ago. We've had uh, Pencils of Promise last week, uh, Autism Speaks, just to name a few, Cigars for Warriors, which is, of course is a great industry favorite. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm really excited as this is kind of progressing. And um, you, you chose, a, you chose um, a charity, and it's a little, uh, not a little, it's very close to home. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really excited about it because uh, world hunger is a huge issue for me. Uh, and I'll let you speak on it, but I just kind of want to introduce it, if you'll permit me. Um, you selected the the pantry of Broward Incorporated, mm -hmm. which is uh, s serves uh, seniors in need of live uh, in in need living on a low fixed income and grandparents raising their grandchildren throughout Broward County, which is where you reside. Right. Um, and uh, founded by an, an amazing woman uh, that I got to read a little bit about. Her name is uh, BJ uh, Buntrock, who's no longer with us. She passed in 2014, um, but she started this organization in um, in uh, in 1983, the year I was born. So uh, really, uh, really, really fantastic, um, fantastic organization. Uh, why don't you tell us your experience with it and why you, why you chose it, Al? Sure. Um... So Pantry of Broward really focuses on not just people who are in need, but more the elderly of people who are in need. And, uh, and the story is, is that I, I had met a gentleman uh, who became my friend and he had worked, he was working really diligently and still does with the people who are homeless in Fort Lauderdale. Broward County is Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, Florida, the areas, you know, the city's, uh, that more people would know, Hollywood, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And so he was working with the homeless situation that was going on there. And then I had asked, how do I get involved? And he said, you know, people are having a tough time. And so we, we looked, you know, we did some research and we found out that the pantry of Broward County does a lot to work with more senior citizens. And I felt that that was really important. Um, in addition, that there are, one of the problems is that they have an opportunity to get, you know, the kind of like the starches that they need, the carbohydrates that, you know, that they need, but they don't necessarily have the protein. So I actually sponsor personally one month of buying um, a protein like chickens for where everybody in the program for one month. And I, you know, I do that because I want people to be able to have uh, an opportunity to, to eat on, you know, to be able to eat properly. So I do that. And I do that for a couple of different organizations uh, in the local community. So I just thought that Pantry of Broward was a very good organization, um, taking care of the people who are truly in need, senior citizens in Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, Hallandale, Florida. Um, in addition, I also do a lot with the uh, Ells for Autism Foundation um, that we try and support, you know, annually, uh, just because Ernie Ells, as you know, Bear, you're a golfer, Ernie Ells, professional golfer, has created this, uh, this campus for, um, for not only kids, but for adults as well, going through, you know, with autism, going through that need therapy and rehabilitation. And, and learning, and he's done a great job there. So between uh, the Pantry of Broward and Ells for Autism, those are two charities we support pretty heavily. Oh, I wanna talk about uh, Ells for Autism here in a second, but I, I, was, I was really touched by one of the stories uh, uh, on the Pantry of Broward's uh, website. Um, so it's, this is just one of, the, one of the many hundreds of people that the Pantry of Broward helps. Uh, it's a woman named uh, Arlene Carpenter. Um, and her life has always been really challenging. When she was five years old, she was diagnosed with polio, apparently, fitted with a brace. And by the time she was nine, she was she was actually uh, she was working agriculturally. She was picking cotton in fields. She she stayed in school until high school, but uh, had to work full time to support her family. This is after self suffering a you know life de debilitating condition as, as a child, and then as a, an adult, she had she had a hard time finding work, and she because of her disability and 
but she uh, she actually uh, you know I found kinship with you because uh, she was a cabinet maker you know in your previous you know previous life so uh, of, mm -hmm. of you that kind of connection to uh, Tal and Ruben there um, she had a you know she had you know hip deteriorated so badly that she needed to have surgery that was required she could no longer do manual labor anymore I mean I mean, just challenge after challenge after challenge, and then I, all all in at the end of the day, her 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 daughter moves back home with three children to take care of to take care of her, right? And then one morning, Arlene walked into her living room and found her daughter um, dead, and I mean, uh, severe heart condition uh, took her daughter's life, and so now Arlene is left with three grandchildren, and she was made instantly a mother one, once again with right. all these difficulties she's gone with. And uh, uh, she receives a food box each month mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, from the pantry of Broward. And, you know, it helps, it helps this, this, this wonderful family that she's uh, trying to keep going. So, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, that's one of the hundreds of touching stories that the pantry of Broward serves. And it's, uh, it's an incredible organization. And, and um, as always, my pledge is uh, Alan each, each week and, you know, as this will continue to go on, and unfortunately, it has to be meager because I, you know, uh, I, 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 I don't have too much money, but I, I'm pleased to donate to every organization that that will be that will be featured on my show each week. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to to no, to donate a little, a small token of, of thanks and uh, to what the Pantry of Brower does this week. So it's exciting. So, um, Bear, Bear, that's that's amazing on your part. I have to tell you, I mean, you, you, you know, you do this show which truly helps our industry in, in, in total and then you decide to also take upon this you know take upon yourself this this charitable contribution piece and, and I can tell you when we're done with this I'm going to make an additional contribution to the the pantry of Broward myself I'm going to do it tonight literally I'm in the office now we're doing this before I leave I'll make an additional contribution to the pantry so you know just uh, you know you you inspire me to, to continue to do more. So I want to thank you. Oh, I appreciate that, Alan. So I'm, I'm going to actually share my screen here. So if you guys are interested, I just posted the link in the uh, the comment section. If you want to, if you guys feel moved to donate, uh, would love, would, uh, Alan, of course, and I would love for you guys to donate. Uh, I think it would be fabulous. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show the screen here. Here's the Pantry of Broward Incorporated's website. It should be up here in just a second if you guys are seeing it. And hey, uh, bear real quick, I just need to take thirty seconds. Give me one. Of course, second. absolutely. Right yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, here, here it is. Um, this is a website. So, feeding seniors in Broward County. We just talked a little bit about it. What a great organization uh, for the county that Alan, uh, you know, and the Rubin family call home, and the great work that they're doing uh, feeding seniors in this particular county. So, really exciting. So, if, again, if you're call, if you feel moved to donate, you can go to the link that I just posted or um, or it would be really great too if you go back on the Ellis with Lamar Facebook page. Um, I posted um, a donate button underneath the advertisements for this the show during the during the course of the week. So uh, definitely check it out. Um, it, you know, if you feel so inclined, if you feel so moved, great organization. Um, and I know that uh, Alan and I would really appreciate uh, you guys uh, taking a look at it. And uh, and uh, if you feel so inclined, uh, f uh, f you know send a few dollars their way because they, they need it. And they're, they're helping out a lot of, a lot of great families in, uh, in Broward County. So uh, wonderful, wonderful selection there. Um, as Alan, as Alan takes a quick break and everything, do want a quick reset here. This is uh this is LL Sufumar takes um, our 148th take. Uh, and it's, it's my pleasure to sit down here with Alan Rubin, the founder and president of Alec Bradley cigars uh, been, been, really excited to, to have this opportunity to sit down with him. And so this has been a great conversation that we've had, uh, had, a, had some fun along the way with one must go. And then now talking about the pantry of Broward and what it's, uh, what it means to Alan and his family. And, um, and so we, uh, we encourage you guys to, to make a contribution. So uh, you can go to the pantry of Broward.org. Um, or again, you could go to the link uh, in the Ellis from our Facebook page on the advertisements that I ran and, uh, and you can, uh, donate there uh through facebook and uh every little bit counts there thank you so so alan going into this uh this second part of the show there are a couple of things i i, I like to bounce around this on timelines as most of our audience knows and and we've we talked a lot about the this new direction that alec bradley is going 
Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit. There are a couple of key moments in the in the past that I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about because I think they're 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 incredibly interesting and why they might have been rehashed a few times, you know, in the course of your 25 year history. I, I think, you know, for, for me, this is I, I'm a big historian, so this is kind of fun to look back and everything. So I wanted to reflect on some key moments in your career and the story of Alec Bradley and everything. So going back to the beginning, you know, I mentioned, you know, we mentioned at the top of the show, you started smoking in your 20s and everything. Um, you know, tell me about that, that, you know, that first experience with a cigar and, and, and what it was like and, you know, what you what ultimately led to you, you know, getting out of the fastener business and, and then diving into, uh, diving into this uh, amazing world and this amazing industry. Yeah, so I had my first cigar when I was uh, I was 22 years old. I, I went to um, I my my roommate, my best friend, you know, one of my best friends. We went to his father's office, and he was a very prominent businessman. And uh, he had this beautiful Ellie Blue humidor on his desk, and um, and I was kind of intrigued, and he saw that <laughs> he saw that I had like. I was intrigued with cigars. I was 22 years old and he, he handed me a couple of different cigars and he said, okay, you know, this one, you can smoke at any time. And this one don't smoke while you're driving and don't smoke while you're kind of moving around. And one was a Dominican Partagas and one was a Cuban Partagas. And um, so I smoked the Dominican Partagas. I'm like, kind of, this is interesting. You know, like, why am I getting these flavors? Why do people smoke? What do they get out? You know, what do they get out of this? Um, to me, it was just a sign of, uh, sign of kind of success. It was a sign of kind of making it because my friend's father was very, very successful and he was into cigars. I didn't understand it. And so it got me, it got me intrigued. And, um, I remember smoking the Cuban, <laughs> the Cuban part of this, and it was a, a, an amazing experience. I, uh, in my fastener business life, I had to end, you know, I ended up having to get on a ladder after smoking this Cuban cigar and I missed a rung, I almost killed myself. Um, and I kind of got what he was saying at that time. Um, but I can tell you a really powerful story that happened over cigars. So I was in my early twenties. I was in the bolt nut and screw business, the fastener business. And Hurricane Andrew had just hit South Florida and we were dealing with a huge hurricane shutter manufacturer and there were four companies that were bidding for all the business and it was hundreds of thousands of dollars in business. And I was the smallest guy out of the four that were bidding. And I remember walking in and I was going to present my proposal and I happened to see the owner who was there, who was, I was in my twenties. He was in his sixties. And he's like, uh, Alan, do you smoke cigars? And I said, I do. He said, well, come on up. So I went up to his office and we spent like two or three hours talking. And he said, yeah, you know, I work with my son. And I said, yeah, I work with my dad. And we talked and we talked about family. We talked about being in business together. <laughs> All over the cigar. If I, if I didn't smoke cigars, there was no opportunity to ever be in that position to have that meeting. And at the end of the day, I got the contract. And Bear, I can guarantee you, I wasn't the lowest price. But he got to know me. We spent two and a half hours over a cigar and some cognac and talk, got to know one another. And at the end of the day, he trusted this young guy to be able to perform for his company. And without the cigar, that never would have happened. And it was kind of at that moment, right? Way before I was in the cigar business that I realized the power of what that cigar does. It brings people together. It breaks down barriers. It builds bond, bonds amongst people. And I was immediately attracted to that and drawn to that. And that was way before I was in the business. That's an incredible story. And it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's evident even throughout our conversation today. Like I, you know, I told you, I regaled you with that story about the family blends with my brother and, mm -hmm. 
you know, that was years ago before I even, you know, had a podcast before I even, uh, uh, just before I knew who Alan Rubin was. And, and here I am years later because of cigars, because of that and many other cigars before it, here I am talking to the man who made that cigar. So it, these things are powerful. Uh, there's just, there's no, no one yeah. can ever convince me otherwise. And, yeah. and, it, and it's evident of it. And, and, and the cool thing, Bear, is that, you know, right now we're doing this via Zoom, you know, we're doing it digitally, but without question in my mind that we could have the same conversation not being filmed. If we were in the same room together, we could have the same conversation, have the same connection, you know, give each other a hug, you know, like this is how you build friendships. And that's what cigars do. They allow you to spend time to get to know the person on the other side of the, you know, across the table. I miss hugs. (laughs) (laughs) We do. Me too. Uh Oh, so in the, in our previous interview, um, Alan, you, you had talked to you, there was a, there was a moment that you had talked about, you were talking about how Alec Bradley hasn't fed your family. This industry has, uh-huh. and it was, and, and I, at the time, I, I, I don't know what my reaction was, but this was after going back and, and listening to it again. And that, that, that statement kind of, uh, I was fixated on it. And, and I know you're going to elaborate on here in a second, but I, I just wanted to pose the question this way as you were building this first 25 years, when you were building this foundation of Alec Bradley and when did, when did the premium cigar industry become your focus? Not just Alec Bradley. When did the premium cigar industry become your focus? So, I mean, I can tell you in all honesty, the, uh, the focus initially was just feeding my family. Right. I mean, I started a new business. I took investment money that I, that I made from selling my old business, you know, firmly entrenched myself in this business. It was about survival without question. And then once things started to move forward and I started to build a name for the company, um, you know, go out and tra- I traveled a lot and, and met a lot of people, a lot of phenomenal people in this business. There was a time, there was a moment that this business was under siege. This business was a target because we're a minority and it was easy to pick on a minority. And and that's what cigar, the cigar industry is. And it was at that moment, I realized that if the industry doesn't survive, Alec Bradley can't survive, nor can any other company, any other brand that all of your listeners may be smoking. None of them could survive if the industry went under. And the industry was under attack. And that's when I realized, yeah, Alec Bradley is what I do every day, but I fit within this industry. And the industry it is far larger. And that's what has to succeed. For me to succeed, the industry has to be healthy, it has to be strong. And that's when my focus changed. It's interesting because I, and I think you'll agree with this point, Alan. And and this is doesn't have to necessarily even be focused on the premium cigar industry, but for the purpose of our conversation, it will be. Not everyone sees big picture that way. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because I think by nature, we end up in our own world. We end up focusing on whatever our personal problem is at the moment. I think we end up focusing on what we can do to put more money in our own pockets, not realizing that there's something way bigger than us. And this industry has been around for a long time. And we've gone through ups and downs and we've gone through federal regulations and state regulations and all of those things. 
And somehow most people think it just goes away. It just somehow magically disappears. And it doesn't. There's a small group underneath that are fighting, that are spending hundreds of hours having conversations, hiring lobbyists, taking money out of our personal accounts to be able to fund the lobbyists and fund all the fights that we need to have, the lawsuits, all of it. And yeah, you can think, hey, I'm going to sit in the corner and let everyone else fight my fight. But you know, think about it this way, Barry. If somebody was attacking your family, what would you do? If somebody was coming after your, your father, your mother, your wife, your spouse, your kids, it'd be personal. You'd never let anything happen. Yet the industry that feeds your family, that feeds those kids and your wife, you're not willing to fight for? Somebody else should fight that fight? That's bullshit. You got to get involved. And that's what I just decided. I can't wait for anybody else. I got to get involved and I have to get involved and I have to fight the fight. And that's what I try and do. So it sounds like this realization came pretty early on for you, which is to our industry's benefit, obviously. Um, and it, it's, I, I take your point, Alan, and I think that I've spent a large portion of my time as a cigar consumer, even before I was doing this this media component, um, talking almost. I almost feel like I'm preaching a lot about about the, the strife of the, the premium cigar industry. And and I, the most frustrating thing for me is that point that you made a moment ago is that people just expect for things to go away, and you think people just expect for things to go to stay normal and everything. And and that's that's it's probably the most difficult thing to show someone who just doesn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. I want to know how, what are some examples that you give when you've, when you're having this, probably this equally frustrating conversation with colleagues or consumers alike, what are some examples you point to to say like, this is what could happen. Here's an example of where it did happen. Here's where we are today, and what what do you use as an example? I'm 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 honestly looking for advice here. This not exactly a, a, a you know part of an interview typically, but I'm looking for advice here, and I and I, but I think it would be I think it would serve my audience well. So I, I think if you look at what affects the consumers or a brand or the tobacconist on a local level, you have to look at what happens in terms of let's say state taxation or state bans, right? California came out and said, we're, we're gonna ban flavors, we're gonna ban cigar bars, it can only be in certain areas, whatever it may be, if you're a grandfather. How do you fight that, right? If, if look at New York, New York that has raised their tax, then they repealed it and came back, and they raised it again. Cigar smokers, we're, we're a bunch of rebels. We don't conform. Cigar smokers just don't conform because if we conform, we wouldn't be smoking cigars, right? But we're, we're a minority. It's easy to pick on the minority. And so what happens is you start to see taxes going up, right? You take the cigar wholesale, taxation on, on double the amount of wholesale. So a cigar that would cost eight or $10 ends up costing $18. And eventually people can't afford to spend $18 a cigar and they stop smoking. Right, it's just a way of getting us out of the business. It's just a, a, about a way of removing us. It happens on the local level, happens on the state level. Look at what would have happened if we didn't fight the lawsuit, the federal lawsuit. Right, all of our boxes would have been covered with eighty percent of the of the box covered in warning labels. Right, think about all the brands that you love, all covered with giant warning labels. That went away. Kintsugi wouldn't. It Correct. probably wouldn't exist. Correct. What about the fact that 
if it wasn't for a lawsuit that right now, right now we're like $8.6 million into a lawsuit with the FDA to get so that we could continue to have products in the marketplace that weren't grandfathered from 2007. You know how many brands would be gone? Think about all these little boutique brands that would just be gone. They didn't have products in 2007. They'd be out. But there's a small group of people and it's it's taxing to cover $8.6 million in lawsuits. Everyone has to contribute. It's our own industry. It's feeding our own families. We all have to be involved. And the truth is, Bear, CRA is a really strong organization and CRA is opening up to allow new manufacturers, boutique manufacturers to come in to give people a voice and to be involved. This is all kind of transitioning right now. I think it's really important for consumers to be able to contribute. Put 50 bucks, every consumer puts 50 bucks to allow them to continue to smoke cigars. Just the right to smoke cigars. That's what we're fighting. So yeah, I think that, uh, I think everyone can be involved. Consumers can be involved. Retailers can be involved. Other manufacturers who are sitting down, by the way, there are manufacturers that may sell half a million or a million cigars, you know, whatever it is every year, they're making a living and don't contribute a single penny towards the fight, but they're feeding their family and they think it's their business that's feeding the family when it's the industry that's feeding their family. So, sure. and I don't want to preach, but this is real. No, you said, you said the last time we were, this subject came up and, and, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it is preaching, Alan. I, I really don't. I just think that, I think that, uh, you know, you know, I've asked a couple of times yet tonight, like, am I just missing the point? I, 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 th I think they're missing the point. Um, and that might be incredibly naive of me, maybe, uh, you know, idealistic, <laughs> which I've certainly been accused of being. Um, but that I, I, I think that, that that point is well taken, and I think it 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 brings it brings our our industry's problem into pretty pretty large stark relief there, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so, and and that's why I was actually pleased this year. I was really excited. I've I've renewed my membership to CRA a number of times over the years, and I've always wanted to do it. This year, I finally was able to. I finally was able and had the opportunity set some money aside and I became a lifetime member. So I was That's able great. to do that. So That's I was great. really, really excited. Um, and I uh, was really excited that I didn't have to always re set the reminder in my phone when my membership was due. <laughs> so <laughs> I never have to do that again. So that's, that was fabulous. Um, and Bear, I can tell you that CRA is reworking their organization. You know, we're re re reworking the organization to be more inclusive, more transparent, have more involvement. I mean, there's a group of people that sit on the board and I sit on the board. I have to tell you, I sit on the board with some amazing people, great businessmen, smart minded people, advocates, people that are willing to push forward. I, I'm very fortunate to even be a part of the group, but the, the leaders of our industry in terms of manufacturing, sit on the CRA board. And one of the things we said is there's so much young talent. There's so many great young brands, not small, big, but younger brands that have so much to give. Why don't we find a way to bring them all in? Give, give everybody a voice so we can move forward as one. And I think that's what our goal is for, for this year coming up. Yeah, you know, on the subject of CRA, you know, it, you know, for the last over, you know, for the last over decade, it's been, it's been led by Glenn Loop, who's mm -hmm. been a mainstay. I mean, what an incredible run that that gentleman has had, um, ups and downs, bumps in the road. Him and I have certainly had our disagreements. Uh, and, uh, but I, I've always said that he's done, he, he did a good, he did a very good job and it was a tireless job. It was a thankless job mm -hmm. and he did a very good job doing it. And, uh, it, it we'd be, I would be remiss if not to take this opportunity in this moment since we're talking about it just to to applaud the effort that he did especially 
in the last 12 months alone, the, the victories that the premium cigar industry has achieved is, is a direct result of, of both y'all's work, uh, you and the rest of your fellow board members, the team at CRA and, and us as a, or, a collective organization and, and the, 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 under his leadership. So that was, that was incredible for him. Um, with that, you know, you know, with the election uh, just last month, it was a, his his time at the head of CRA uh, has come to an end. The the Glenn Loop era, so to speak. Um, you know, since you sit on the board, I mean, what where does that stand as far as replacing a successor to him? Or is this something that's going to be in the works for the rest of the year? I mean, are we are we in coming days? Are we expected to hear nominations or uh, you know a person to to take that position? What's the status of that uh, that position? Uh, we had a couple of we had a a conversation just a couple of days ago about uh, you know finding a, an executive director and I think we we have an idea uh, of what we're looking for in terms of it uh, of an executive director moving forward. Um, there were a lot of changes we need to make. You know what happens is you had an organization that has been around and kind of operating the same way for you know uh, ten years. So we had to kind of get up with the times. We need an executive director moving forward. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be pursuing uh, someone to fill that position. There are some names that have been kind of thrown around. And there's, I, I think what happens is we have a better understanding as an organization as to what the needs are, where, where we want to be moving forward. And I have to tell you, Glenn, Glenn did an amazing job. He really did. Um, Glenn had to keep all these business owners, egos, <laughs> everything involved, everything in check, move things forward, deal on so many levels. And Glenn was a, was a master of that. But as we progress and move forward as CRA, we need to, we kind of re need to kind of hone our skills and move forward in another direction. And uh, I'm excited to see us do that. But by the way, it's not just CRA. Look at PCA, right? You know, no trade show in 2020. 2021, we're not sure. PCA has been the driving force for over 80 years in our industry. Mm -hmm. So the organizations work well together and we're trying to just figure, you know, things out as to like, where does each piece fit? But I think there's some exciting things for, for our industry moving forward, personal. I think you kind of touched on the reason, the particular reason why, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this again, because you, you sit on the board. And again, this is, this is probably just me missing it, the point again, but it, it, it's curious to me, it was puzzling to me that, that a successor wasn't named, prior, considering how much time he gave with his notice. Mm -hmm that if successor wasn't named earlier, is there, was there any particular reason why a successor hasn't been named yet or during, during his tenure, was it contract related? Was it, was there just something that was unable to do or is it this valuation period that you were talking about a moment ago? So the only reason a, uh, another successor has not been named is that, you know, you sit, the board consists of a lot of CEOs of CRA, right? There's a lot of CEOs, there's a lot of presidents on the, on the board. And so the organization in itself can be run with the people who sit on the board now. We can't necessarily move forward without an executive director, but it can be run and comfortably with all the people. There's a lot of bright people. There's a lot of talent in the CRA board so they can continue to move it forward until we find the right executive director to take it to the next level. Fair enough. We kind of digressed a little bit off of uh, going back to the beginnings of Alec Bradley and everything, but I, I wanted to touch on a story that I, I think is great. Uh, by the way, I'm still on the lookout for any bogey stogies. So if anyone out there has one, I, I, I will, I will, I don't know how much of a premium I can afford, but I will pay a premium for it because I'd love to try it out. So I know you don't, we've had this discussion. I know you don't have any out, Alan, but, uh, but I would, if, if any bogey stogies exist out there, I would love to go ahead and take them off your hands. Um, hey, hey, Bear, just so you know, if you reach out to Alec and Bradley with that request and they start to bug me where I can like remember to make it a priority, 
I'll see if I have something uh, kind of up in the rafters of our humidor. To see if, you know, if I have any put away so I can send you a couple of cigars. Oh my gosh. That would be, that would be incredible. <laughs> That'd be incredible. Uh, they'll be well, I know they'll be well aged, but uh, I'm, ex I'm excited to taste a little piece of history. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Uh, so, so back to the beginning of Alec Bradley, you, you, I, I was, I was reflecting on something earlier this week because um, Nick Perdomo of Perdomo Cigars um, celebrated uh, Arthur Kemper, his longtime partner, vice president, uh, his 20th year with the company. And it got me thinking, I was like, oh, that's, that's really cool because this is, this is Ralph Montero's 20th year with you. Correct. And um, I was like, wow, that's two non blood familial, you know, predominant relationships that have existed for so long in this industry have been staples of, uh, you know, him and Arthur, you and Ralph, you know, for the last two decades, um, you know, and so it got me thinking about um, the story of, of when you guys came together, which was around Occidental Reserve. And, uh, I, and I don't know how much you can certainly enlighten me if, about the, the truth of the story, but I, I read somewhere that Occidental Reserve started um, when Ralph put you in touch with with Hanky Kellner, and you guys were able to produce the cigar, and it was, it you know the 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 boom had come and gone, and you you were looking to take Alec Bradley to to the next level, and mm -hmm. uh, and there was it, it it was a huge financial burden to you at the time. If if the numbers are correct or off, I, I apologize, but I read somewhere that was like. You guys had like a sixty thousand dollar deficit. You had three thousand dollars in the bank, and you rolled forward with this project. Uh, and then it it took off. And and you know, it was kind of you know, share with us like what if and again, if I was inaccurate, I apologize. But that's what I read. Um, you know what <laughs> what that what that I guess that moment that pinnacle moment was like for the two of you at the beginning of your partnership, which has now led to twenty years of success. Yeah. Um, yeah. So even me meeting Ralph was like a 15 second moment in time that had I, we met in a little place in Miami. I was buying cigars. I was just, you know, in the business. Ralph was already in the business a lot of years because he started when he was 18 under his uncle, Pedro Martin. Um, uncle, right. Yeah. So he, 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 I think I was, I was walking in, he was walking out. We introduced our, you know, we introduced ourselves to one another. Literally, had I been caught at the stoplight, I never would have met Ralph, who's now with me, you know, 20 years. So it was one of those moments in time. I don't believe in, in chance, right? I believe that, you know, there was, there was fate involved here. And, um, yeah, I mean, he was struggling. You know, the boom was over. He was struggling. I was struggling. I knew he had a good financial background. Um, he had a lot of connections in the business. And I had asked him to, I said, hey, I know you're, you're struggling and I'm struggling. And, but I, I really need help. And if you can come work with me and help me out, um, you know, it's, it's some income for you. I, I don't want to go out. I don't want to go out of business. And can you help me? And he said, okay. And he came to work with me and, um, you know, 20, <laughs> 20 years later, um, we've had every fight other than physical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we fight over everything. Um, but when we agree, it's something special, you know? So yeah, he's been right by my side the whole time. And uh, he's been an amazing asset to the company. Um, no matter of fact, last week while I was here, he was down in Central America. Three days before that, he was in Dominican Republic, you know, looking over productions. He's, yeah, he's, uh, he's right there. And um, it's a game changer. I'm not sure I would be here without him. So, and I don't know that Nick can say the same thing with Arthur, but probably so. You know, Arthur's Arthur's added a lot to the business, and Ralph has added a lot to Alec Bradley. So, yeah, I mean, he's he's family on every level. We uh, 
we've gone through hell together. We have had each other's backs in a corner. We've been in the alley together. Um, yeah, we've we've uh, we've pushed each other. It's we've gone through personal personal situations, you know, professional situations, and I'm not sure if there's anybody else that I would want to you know want to have, have fought you know this fight with, other than Ralph. He's uh, man. There you bring it, you know, you bring up something that's like, it's, it's so deep and it's so personal because when you have two people that are struggling, you may need each other, but at the end you want each other. Like, that's the strong part is like, he knows my strength and I know his strength and he knows my weakness more importantly. And I know his weakness and we kick each other's ass every single day. But at the end, we hug and we smile. You know, it's like we made it through another day. We continue to push forward. We kind of shake our heads sometimes like, hey, you were right. I was wrong. Or, you know, I was right on this one and you were wrong. But it didn't matter. None of that mattered. What mattered is at the end, we all did it together. And then also think about this. I have Alec and Bradley coming in. Ralph has to figure out how to deal with my kids. You know, it's not, the dynamics are not easy, but we navigate it every day. It's cool. Partnerships are one of those interesting things that, you know, there's so many partnerships in this industry that have fizzled, mm -hmm. that have failed. Like even what you would consider even all-star partnerships, right? That just didn't work out. And I, I think you touched on this a moment ago, Alan, that you, you found someone that challenged you and he found someone that challenged him. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately leads to successful partnerships because if you've, you need balance as, as you said, because, you know, at the end of the day, peanut butter is great, but, you know, you know, peanut butter and jelly is the worldwide phenomenon. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the joke here is that if Ralph doesn't like it, I know it's going to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the joke. But like the first question is, you know, like, I really like that. Did Ralph like it? He didn't like it. All right, let's go. You know, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> But it's his, it's his job to, to push me and to question me and to make me prove it. You know what I'm saying? He, I can tell you, if everyone in the room says yes, you only need one person. I've never surrounded myself with yes men. I want someone who's going to tell me, no, that's not a good idea. And I'm going to ask them why. And we, we hash it out. And that's always been wrong. See, I love that. And that takes me back. I, I, I don't know if, did you ever, did you ever happen to watch, it was a very short lived program. It was a television show called Sports Night. No. Peter Krauss, Josh Charles. It was an Aaron Sorkin written production. One of my favorite, it lasted two seasons. Uh, Robert Gillamy, amazing actor. He, he, he portrays this, this guy named Isaac Jaffe and he's the leader of this, this, this sports production company, right? Um, sports broadcast company. And him and Joshua Molina's character go back and forth and Joshua Molina's character says, I, 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 I did what I was told because I, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't agree with it. It didn't really matter. Cause I, I did what I was told because I thought that's what was expected of me. And, you know, Gillamy's character goes, goes, you know, it basically ape shit on him. And he says, you know, you know, you know, he's like, it's taken me a lot of years, but I've come around to this. If you're smart, surround yourself with, you know, with, if you're dumb, surround yourself with smart people. And if you're smart, surround yourself with smart people who disagree with you. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm an awfully smart man. And that's why I, that's why I chose you. Um, is cause you disagree with me. So it's, it, I, I think that's poignant to, to what we were just talking about is that, you know, you, you have a very smart man that's working with you that, that 
that doesn't agree with you hardly ever it sounds like <laughs> right uh and it's it's led to you know 25 years of success um yeah and, and by the way when we do agree then we know okay this is something you know i i always joke that when people say hire where you're weak i said if i hired anybody else i wouldn't have a job so you know I'm, i try and hire everybody around me to push me forward and i my job at some point is not only cigar blender or creator or business guy but my job is also to be able to is to challenge people to be better so if i want to work less the only way for me to work less at some level is to make sure i'm challenging everybody to be better to their next level so yeah maybe it's a little selfish but i challenge everybody to try and be better think differently you know don't don't get caught up in what you think you know ask the next question so indeed absolutely uh, so i would be completely remiss if not to discuss this one point in your history which is of course 16 years into uh, alec bradley you guys are bestowed the the ultimate honor Prinsado is named the number one cigar of the year and the the ultimate fallout is well documented Alan. i don't necessarily want to get into it mm -hmm. that specifically but I do want to get into something. I do want to get into the part of the story where I was already, I, I mean, I'm not just saying this because you're on the program, Alan. I was already an Alec and Bradley, Alec and Bradley fan. Like it just was. Um, the, excuse me, Alec Bradley fan. I, I, I just was. And like I told you my affinity for the family blend. I really like to select cabinet reserve. We want to go to old school. Um, I, before I knew how the Cigar Aficionado Top 25 worked, I always said that they got it wrong because the Tempest is, in my opinion, the better cigar. <laughs> um, um, but uh, that all being said and everything, the, where, where that changed for me, and I, and, and I say change, and I mean that for the better, and I, and what I, it was the, it was the, I can honestly say that this was the moment for me where I knew that this was an industry that I wanted to be a part of. And it was the moment that you fell on the sword. Yeah. The fallout of being number one, named number one, the, the, the production falling off the way that it did. Again, I don't want to get into that. I want to get into the, I want to talk about the moment that you decided to demand an interview <laughs> with Cigar and Aficionado because you wanted this story to be told and you wanted to come out publicly and you wanted to accept responsibility. Why did this have to happen in your words? Okay. Um, So what happens is you get this pinnacle of an award and you are, and I was, I was taken aback. Okay. <laughs> Let's start with the fact that I got in this business and I was just trying to feed my family. And I remember seeing certain icons in this business, someone like Robbie Levin from Ashton Cigars, walking down our trade show floor with four or five people. When I came to the trade show with just me and one other person, I didn't have five people with me. You know, like you looked at these people that were iconic and who still are. Every brand before me was either, was, it, was a Cuban brand or a Cuban family. The chances of me getting number one, I mean, what, what were the chances? You know what I'm saying? Like, what was that? And then it happened and life changes and there's credibility and you're not sure what to do. You know, I wasn't sure what to do. 
I didn't know what my day was going to be. And I was called to every corner of the United States. Travel, come do events. Can you get me product? It was, the whole thing was a, um, the whole thing was just overwhelming on every level. And I, I, I should have been at the factory. But when I went to the factory and said, okay, do you have this? Are we okay? The answer was yes. And so I traveled and I handled phone calls and why can't you get me product? And how come I'm short from I ordered 25 boxes, you, you got me three. You know, it was like, there were so many problems to handle. And yet I should have been at the factory and I wasn't. All of a sudden I realized that even though they said the factory can handle it, they couldn't. And that was an amazing realization. It was, it was tough. And there was, a, there was a tremendous amount of sleepless nights when I realized we had a problem. And what happens is you start to realize, Bear, you start to realize that every now and then you get, a, you know, you'd get somebody who would say, oh, you know, this, my cigar didn't burn well, or, you know, it was a little bit soft or this or that. But all of a sudden you're starting to sell so many more cigars. I mean, we grew 62% in one year. And we started to get more complaints, more problems. And I and someone said, well, maybe we're just selling so many more cigars, the problems are going to be a little bit more. You know, it's a handmade product. You're going to have some issues, whatever. But it was past that. And that's when I realized, like, we have a problem. And after months of not sleeping, months in a state of just shock, I said, okay what do I do? And we spent a lot of time, months and months and months down in Central America, fixing the problems from the fields, fertilization, from the drying barns, the fermentation into the factory. We looked at every process and we started to figure out where did we miss? What do we need to do better? And when we finally figured out that there were, we had a better control of what was going on, I said, well, how are people going to ever forgive us for just putting bad cigars in the market? When we were under the radar, we were growing, you know, double digit percentages year over year over year. All of a sudden we're on the radar. We get number one and we're not ready. And I find out when everyone else finds out. So it's not like I could prepare and make, you know, half a million cigars and be ready to go. So it took about a year and a half or two years to really figure out every place that we had missed and how to make things better and put processes in place and better quality control in place. Change our supervisors, change all the processes, change everything. And when I did that, I realized people may not forgive us. And I don't blame them. You know, people give us that hour of their day and we let them down. And so <laughs> I remember I remember making the call to Dave Sabona and I'm like, Dave, I have an idea for you. I think you should write a story. And, <laughs> and it's about me. <laughs> you call a national publication and tell them you should write a story about me. And said, we should call it life after number one. I mean, it's kind of ballsy to be able to call a national publication, international publication, and say, do an article on me. Here's what you should call it, and here's why. And all Dave said was, tell me more. And when I was done, he said, are you sure you want to tell that story? And I said, no, but I have to. I have to apologize for the mistakes that I made because people trusted in me to do the right thing, to give them that hour that they deserve after a hard day of work. And I, I let them down and I need to own up to it. And Dave said, okay, come up. And I flew to New York and I remember walking from my hotel room to Cigar Fisher and out of his offices 
It was a beautiful day. It was like 70 degrees, the wind was blowing, the sun was out. And by the time I got to the officer's bear, it looked like I had jumped in a pool. I was sweating. I was nervous. I was shaking. And then I sat down and gave a two hour interview of my life and confessed everything. And I said to Dave, if you ask it, and you know this, Bear, if you ask it, I'm going to answer. And I'm going to be honest. And I told everything. And, and then it, uh, some months went by. And then they put that article in their issue that has top 25 cigars of the year. And I remember them calling me up. I remember actually Marvin Schenken calling me up and said, I had no clue what you were going through. I mean, a personal touch from Marvin saying, I had no clue that this is, this is what happened. And David called me up about a month after the article hit and said, I think this is the best article we ever did. And the response has been phenomenal. And people, people believe you're, you know, people were humbled by your honesty and transparency. And I said, I didn't do it for, I, I did it for selfish reasons. I did it because I had to tell the story. And that was it. And for the most part, people forgave me and continued to support the brand and continued to move forward with me. And had I not done it, I would have done cigar consumers a disservice. So I didn't do it for business. I did it because at the end, I remember leaving cigar aficionados offices and getting on a, taking a, a taxi back to the airport. And remember, I felt like 20 pounds lighter. Like I finally got this monkey off my shoulder, you know, off my back. I'm ready to, ready to rule the world. But I had to, I had to get that thing done. I had to, I had, that had to be in my past. Respectfully, Alan, I'm going to disagree with you. You said it was okay. selfish. I don't think there's a, I don't think there's anyone listening to that, myself included, that could say that any part of that was selfish. You, you spoke very candidly about the catharsis that you felt from this act. Your word was selfish. I'll say selfless act. What was a bigger moment for you? That catharsis or the actually being named number one from a Alec Bradley standpoint? Interesting question. From an Alec Bradley standpoint, being the first non-Cuban brand or non-Cuban family to get number one, that was pretty exceptional. From a personal standpoint, moving forward, without question, me telling that story was the driving force for us to be where we are today. I have nothing more to add on that point, Alan. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's, it's beautiful. It really is. I think the one thing I will say um, that this has done, again, in a very selfless way, this act, again, you call it selfish, I call it selfless, has given 
not so much back to the consumer, not so much back to your trusted consumers, retailers and smokers alike. Do you realize what you've done for every company since that's been named number one? Has that even occurred to you? No, no. I'll give you two examples. Andalusian Bull, and Arturo Fuente, Don Carlos, Eye of the Shark. Two cigars that were never intended to be regular production. They were always supposed to be limited production. Get named number one cigar of the year. I mean, there's no way, there's no way possible to tell what would have happened. My contention is that if your story hadn't taken place, is that similarly history could have repeated itself in a very, very tragic way. And I don't want to speak for Lito and I don't want to, I certainly don't want to speak, speak for Lito or I certainly don't want to speak for Carlito, but, but what I will say, if they stayed true to that limited production, you can't get an <laughs> shark. You can't get an Andalusian. Well, still to this day. Um, and, there are many people that might be disgruntled about that, but I say the industry is better served by that because when they do have the opportunity to smoke that cigar, it is the number one cigar of the year it's worthy of that title. Yeah. Maybe, you know, bear, maybe they were just smarter than that. And maybe they learned a little something, maybe, but I guess, I guess I was trying to please everybody and you know ended up in the end pleasing nobody and maybe they realized hey let's just stay truer to who we are if this was our what our production was supposed to be let's just stay there all smart moves i mean i can tell you that i remember papine got the number one cigar after i did and we were the first i was the first person to call papine in nicaragua to congratulate him. And then when Ernesto Perez Carrillo got number one, I called him up and I said, Ernie, my friend, congratulations. No one deserves it more than you do. And he said, I was just going to call you. And I said, why is that? He said, what do I do now? I've heard this story. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, I can tell you what not to do. So, yeah. Listen, some people, um, not everyone had the kindest words to say after, you know, after the article, but it was never about that. It was about kind of professing my soul, saying, I know I screwed up. Let's move forward. And let me tell you something. Consumers are a pretty cool bunch in this, in, in this industry. Cigar people are, are great people. And they're like, you know, I can tell you more people than not, more consumers than not turned to me when I saw them and would say like, I have your back, I had your back. Yeah, that says a lot about our industry. It certainly back, does. Yeah, to back and it said, hey, I know you were going through a tough time. I had, I had your back. Yeah. That's power. That's those are powerful statements and powerful emotions. Indeed. I I think what you've done for the cigar industry with that, Alan, will be felt for decades to come in a very positive way. That's 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 my contention on it. So I appreciate that. Um, from the small world, the small corner of the world that I reside in, I, I can't thank you enough, sincerely. We're going to move to something a little more fun. Okay. Literally, I promise again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have to. I have to talk to you about this project because it literally is 
in my life in my lifetime in the cigar industry it is by far and people can fight me on this if they want I'll, I'll i'll take them out for you man i have your back on this because there is nothing there was no cooler launch literally in the history of this industry than the launch of mundial oh yeah where you literally launched your cigars into space <laughs> i there is still i i nothing is nothing is compared since and i don't think anything ever will compare to that that was that was absolutely brilliant that was absolutely incredible i want to know who came up with the idea how this was pulled off and i want to ask the biggest question why <laughs> so the, the toughest answer will be to the question why <laughs> okay um so we have a, a guy that we actually still work with today, a guy named Gianni Brunetti. And Gianni was working with us in-house at the time. And, and Mundial means global or worldly. And so he, he said to me, why don't, we, why don't we just launch this thing up into space? Like it's global, it's worldly. Let's, let's give a world view. Of, from 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 the mundial eye <laughs> and i'm like okay listen you're out of your mind okay <laughs> i'm not sure with by the end of the week if you'll still be employed here <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of consequence there's a lot of consequences to these type of suggestions and i said okay well, well what do you mean and he said well you know, they're like people that are launching stuff into space and they're doing it on these weather balloons. And I'm like, let's find out. And uh, he did some research and we found a, a young company, a bunch of young guys out of, uh, I think they were out of LA. And we just coordinated it. And we were doing the trade show in Las Vegas. And I have a friend of mine, uh, Phil Maloof, who uh, his family owned, used to own the Sacramento Kings and they owned the Palms casino they owned the palm casino, you know casino and he owned the penthouse at the at the palms next door and i called him like phil we're gonna launch cigars into space can we do it from your place that, that was where we had the press party right that's correct from a couple of years ago okay yeah he's like yeah let's do it <laughs> and uh and everything was coordinated and it, you know what's really funny is if you look over my shoulder that humidor right there behind me the original case of the Mundial that went into space are, is sitting in that humidor. And the cigars are still in it too, right? The so, cigars are still in it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one oh. day, one day for a good reason, I'll auction that off for charity. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. It was the cool, it was the coolest, it was the coolest thing ever. It really was. It was, it was just so outlandish. Um, and just, just, oh God, there's no other way to, I'm going to be punny here. It was just out of this world. It really was. And, 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 and here's the thing that, here's the thing that I really loved about it is that it, it that was, that was, that was the, that was the start, right? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you best this, right? And to this day, it is still my favorite Alec Bradley cigar. <laughs> so it, it it delivered on this exceptional this exceptional launch and everything. I I love that blend. I think it, I just it is yeah. so good. That cigar is so phenomenal. I I mean, I, and I was a I was a Tempest nut before that happened. Um, and I told you my love for Family Blends, like Cabinet Reserve, and bunch of other productions beforehand but i the the mundial to me just really for me took 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 the cake i i and i i still it is my still my favorite alec bradley cigar it just well, hands down is bear i have to tell you it took us from the time we started working on mundial it took us five years to get the blend where we wanted it that's how crazy it is so oh, wow the, that whole project was so different from anything we had done as a company. Five years to create the blend. Uh, we'd worked with the same graphic designer that we worked with for Tempest and, and Prensado. 
um, there was like all the stars were aligned. And I think when Gianni came to me and said, like, let's launch this thing to space, it was like <laughs> anything to get this thing finished and into the market's fine by me. <laughs> this point, right? Just yeah, taking this five whatever. years, like, do please it. do, I don't care what it is, just let's do it. And uh drive a Ferrari in a brick wall. I don't care. <laughs> just correct. Do it. Just, <laughs> right. Just make sure the insurance is covered. But yeah. Uh but it was like just one of those things. Like it was like, man, it took us five years to get this thing in, you know, into into production, and we finally have it. Let's do something special with it. And what was really cool was because there were GPS trackers and GoPros on there, and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like they had to drive two and a half hours into the desert in Vegas to retrieve this peak. <laughs> And I'm like, man, I hope we have good footage. And then the footage was spectacular. It was just amazing. And uh, and people still talk about it. So I think it's, it's pretty cool. It was incredible. Just yeah. incredible. Yeah. The, the the unique Vitolas of it too, are, I think are some a, a winning point. And, you know, I what I really love about the blend is just how there's this 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 really pronounced creaminess that just sings through that entire experience on every single vitola and i'm a big vitola snob like there are cigars that i like uh, that i love and over the moon about a certain vitola and just not the the other vitolas just don't hit just don't hit with me and i'm a but the moon dial every single vitola that creaminess just kind of sings through it it's balanced with spice and earthiness and complexity they're just it's a just a dynamite cigar and I, I i i i truly love it i truly love that cigar and i love everything that from the story till till now and it it's just uh it's 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 incredible um it really is so well, thank listen thank you and and that means a lot to me i mean you smoke a lot of cigars and and uh you you're you're intimately involved with all the different brands and manufacturers and cigars. So for you to love Mundial means a lot to me because the, you, you get it. I mean, that creaminess and the balance of it, and it's got enough to keep you interested. You know, it's like, mm. there's enough there on that cigar. And so what happens is when you look at the, when you look at the, um, the translation of Mundial, right. Being worldly or, or global, we wanted the cigar to have a worldly feel, meaning that people all over the world can understand the creaminess and the balance and the complexities of that of that blend. So it was like not made for the US market, not made for the European market. It was made for this kind of global mentality of somebody who wants a nice cigar that's really well balanced that they could enjoy. And that was the that was the precipice for coming up with that blend for for Mundial. Uh, very bold goal you know it's, it's it's easy to understand why it took five years to to to, to come to fruition what yeah. what would what went into the decision for the unusual vitola shapes that that was curious to me um we wanted to do something that was different from what we had done and something that would have a more global appeal to it so you know to be able to bring the lighting tip on there um to do the different the different sizes that we did was all about again, we have to think differently. We have to think outside of our box to a, a larger level. And so it was a, it was challenging, you right, to come up with the right sizing, to come up with that punta lanza, what we call the point of the lance on there. It, there was so much behind it. There was so much history behind it. It took so long to come to fruition. And so we just wanted to make sure that the sizing was indicative of what we wanted the market to see for, for us. So, yeah, there was a lot there. Just, just incredible. Love Thank it. You. Love everything about it. Thank you. Um, now I've got two more questions, uh, and this is always the time of night that I always thank my guests. Um, and I did it at the very top of the show. I'll, I'll say it again. I, I can't thank you enough um, for taking the Sunday night away from your family, away from your wife, away from your kids, uh, to sit down and regale my audience and me uh, with the the stories of your life and uh to have a little fun along the way and and uh it, it's it's it means the world to me uh, it really does all my guests that they they do this every sunday night they sit down with me and they take time away from their personal family it's 
it, it means it means so much. So thank you so much for the opportunity to sit and talk with you. You know, Bear, it's um, it's my pleasure. It's my honor. Uh, you, you know, you you've interviewed so many people, so many great guests and cool guests on your show, and for me to be included in that group is is quite an honor. And this conversation that we're having, whether there was one or a million people watching, this is just a conversation you and I are having. And we could do this, like I said, if it wasn't digitally, we could do this sitting in my office or sitting at a cigar bar somewhere and have the same conversation. And that's what you make it feel for me. It's like two friends sitting down, just having a real conversation, wanting to know a little bit about my history or my past or whatever it may be. So um, I, I'm not sure I would, could be this, you know, hundred percent open or transparent if the questions weren't phrased to me properly, like if you didn't show that real interest. So thank you. It, it, you you've, made, you've made tonight special for me and interesting for me. And I hope that your, uh, hope that your, you know, your listeners and your guests just got a little glimpse as to who we are as a company and who I am as a person. I certainly think that they got more than a glimpse on and, and, and I'm humbled by your words, truly. And, and again, thank you so much. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited. You know, we announced a couple of weeks ago when I had the boys on um, that we're uh, ushering a new era in here at uh, Ellis Fumar Takes. Uh, the sun will be setting on the HF Barcelona studios of Euless, Texas, and we'll be, uh, um, um, we'll be, now we've already announced, but we'll, we will now be home to the Alec Bradley studios. And, uh, I'm I'm excited to beyond excited beyond honored to to have your name and your son's names behind me and and, uh, and this project that I've I've taken on and over the last three years and hopefully this is the foundation that I've set like the 25 years that you have mm -hmm. into building something really great and phenomenal phenomenal and I'm I'm excited to I'm excited to continue to build it with you and I I thank you for the opportunity. We are uh, we're we are just as excited and we're 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 honored to be able to support somebody who put so much energy and effort and passion into our industry, and you know we're just we're just happy to be a part of it with you. So we're we're looking forward to the journey and the ride together. I can tell you that. Wonderful. I one last thing I do want to I, I want to point out this comment um, from the chat this evening. So. Uh, Joe D, who's a, a broker up in Rhode Island, represents uh, some phenomenal brands uh, and in this industry and everything. And uh, he's 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 made a couple of great points tonight. But uh, he he said again, he said again with with this humble. This is the most humble and honest take ever. This gentleman refusing referring to you is amazing. I need to meet him and thank him for his service to this industry. So I, I wanted to I wanted to pass his words along to you. That was really nice. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, the last two questions, uh, my curveball segment will be the second one, which is always our, our fun conclusion to the show. Um, but, uh, I, I, be remiss for all the hard work that you've put into this industry, Alan, what an incredible victory the cigar industry has had, uh, in 2020, 2020 has been a, <laughs> a cluster <laughs> for a lot of things in a lot of ways. And, um, but the premium cigar industry got a, got a, a huge victory with the basically what it amounted to an indefinite stay um, on the decision from uh, Judge Menta about the uh, substantial equivalence. And um, I don't say this opens the door, but it certainly opens the window for opportunity for younger brands, potentially even new brands to actually launch again in this industry and actually mm -hmm. be able to take a foothold. But for someone who's built uh, an, a tremendous company over the last 25 years and you wanting to take this to the next 25 and beyond, what what from your from your perspective, what kind of what kind of window does this open for you guys? What do you what do you see out of this victory that the premium cigar industry gained because of your hard work, by the way? Don't, definitely <laughs> want to note that. Well, first, let me start by saying that um as an industry and the leaders within the industry from the retail segment, from, you know, uh, Premium Cigar Association and, and, and those, those retail members and that board and CRA and that board, the first thing we got right is that we picked the right federal litigator. Let me start by saying that because if it wasn't for the tenacity of our attorney moving forward with Judge Maida 
and, and finding out where we needed to be because the truth is we were picked on it wasn't right on so many levels and he was able to point that out for the judge to be able to see that it wasn't it wasn't right so the first thing that the industry did right it was pick the right attorney um but i think what that does is that gives by the way it's exciting for me to know that there are younger newer cigar manufacturers will, that will have the sustainability to move forward because of this ruling Mm -hmm. because the excitement in our industry comes from new things and new people and new personalities. And so that's very exciting for me. Um, but what it does for our company is all the plans that we had that had to be put aside are now back in play. And so that's why I said, I'm back in. I, I, I can't wait for what we're going to come up with for 2021. Um, Alec and Bradley have the chance to play in the sandbox and figure out where they want to be and what they want to do. So this ruling not only has it helped us, but it helped people that had products in the marketplace after 2007. And it gives people an opportunity to move forward, build new personalities, you know, build, this is a, this is a business of personalities and it gives, it gives this industry a great future because of all the hard work that everyone put in to have that kind of a victory. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of great things that came out of it. And by the way, we're not done. I can tell you that we had conversations over the last couple of days. There's more lawsuits, more things moving forward to give us to make sure that we have some permanent sustainability moving forward. There's a lot going on. Yeah. The, the fight certainly isn't over by any stretch no. of the imagination. Um, but this was a, this was a great win for everyone from from alec yeah. bradley to alec and bradley mm -hmm. to all the young cigar manufacturers and hopefully new brands to come yes for so, sure really exciting so i wanted to conclude tonight with our our curveball segment this isn't really a curveball helen it's more like a grapefruit that i toss up and i think it's meant to be fun and this one is fun uh so we we we, we talked in the green room about our our love for the for the game of, of golf mm -hmm. and uh uh, so I, I threw out, I actually had a the question. I threw it out because I, I thought this would be a fun question to ask. So um, so I, knowing that your affinity for the game of golf and everything, if you could play a round of golf as anyone, as anyone, who would it be? As anyone. This is a two-part um, question. I'm going to participate too, by the way. I would... Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would, uh, I would probably. Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question. I would, uh, I would maybe play as Jack Nicholas. Golden Bear. Yeah. Yeah, I would probably play as Nicholas to see what was what his thought process was in some of those masters rounds when he was either up or down what's the mentality what's the thought process what is he looking to achieve shot to shot to shot like what what does that all mean so i think that would be how i would play that there's one or one more question to this, but I want to answer this question too. So I, if I had to play a round of golf as anyone, I would choose Bobby Jones. Why? Bobby Jones had this, this, this un, and there's a lot of, a lot of his successors in the game of golf that have had this, 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 this desire for perfection, but he kind of started it all. He had, and in fact, he even suffered you know, mentally and physically because of this, 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 this drive that he had him. He was, he was an accomplished academic in several areas. You know, he, everything he did was just perfection and his game of golf was, was, was no different. I would just love to see what that felt like. Let me ask you this then. How about Ben Hogan after the injury coming back? Yeah. Wouldn't that be 
Like, what does that drive mean? How does that drive affect you? How do you come like, back from that? Yeah. How do you, how do you come back from that, you know, almost uh, death of an accident? Mm -hmm. To be able to play that kind of golf that way. I mean, what do you have to do mentally, physically, the challenges? So maybe even Ben Hogan, I think, would be right up there. With That's that. a good one, too. Absolutely. So here's a, here's a, a, a fun takeaway from that question, too. So if you could, okay, now it's you. You're, you're Alan Rubin again, <laughs> okay? Not, okay. Uh, if you, Alan Rubin, could beat anyone, who would you like to beat at the game of golf? I would probably, this is going to sound wonky, completely wonky, but I would probably like to beat Phil Mickelson at Augusta. Okay. Oh, wow. He, so you even got the course picked out. Okay. Interesting. Well, the only reason is, is because Phil is a character. He's not my favorite golfer by any stretch of the imagination, but he's a character and he he's, he's verbal and he's mental and he's, he's very cerebral. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be fun not just about golf, but I think it'd be fun to banter with a guy like Phil moving forward through a whole round. So you mentioned banter. Um, my pick is a little unconventional too, and it's another little blast from the past. I would love in his prime to beat Lee Trevino. Got it. That guy talks so much shit. Right. And it was all in fun. And he had that jolly laugh about him. And he, I mean, talk, we talked about earlier about you having fun in this industry, right? Mm -hmm. What, what a great comparison in the, in the game of golf. He loved life. He loved, he loves life. He's still alive. He loves life. He loved golf. He loves golf. And he loved being around the people that he was around. And he was a fierce competitor. I would love in his prime. I would love to have beaten Lee Trevino. Um, do you find it interesting that we both pick characters? I do. I do. To play against. Yeah. It's just, my, 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 my father actually had the opportunity to meet and he spent a lot of time because, you know, Lee, Lee Trevino is from my hometown of El Paso, Texas. You know, you know, he was mm -hmm. a groundskeeper uh, that, uh, that emerged into infamy and, and was the subject of many prop bets is that, you know, people taking advantage, you know, we took a lot of money off people's hands. Like I had a groundskeeper that can play groundskeeper. And, you know, just, I, I love his story. I think it's great. My, my father actually played a few rounds of golf with him over the years and stuff and, and uh, met him a number of times. And I, I remember this interview that Lee gave uh, to a local broadcaster here in the DFW area, Randy Galloway, a number of years ago. And he was, he was, he was recanting stories and I, I immediately called my father and I was telling him, I was like, Ali Trevino is doing this interview. And I was like, he is telling the stories that I heard you tell thousands of times. And it, it, it was just such a beautiful moment. Um, That's great. Because so many people that had never had heard the name Lee Trevino, but really didn't know him, got to know this man that, that I grew up idolizing, uh, yeah. that I grew up with stories uh, about like this uh, Paul Bunyan like character, um, and it was, it was, it was so it was really cool. It was really cool to hear that interview. It was really cool to, to have to see have everyone else have that kind of experience and and uh, to be able to experience that. And so he, he uh, I would love to beat him at the game of golf. That would have been that would have been awesome. Did uh, did your dad know Jackie Burke? Um, I yes yes he did. Mm -hmm. I yeah. figured because when you said local to that area. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. My, my, my father's never met a stranger in his entire life. I have, I've, I've, I've kind of acquired that trait in him. Um, and, uh, and he, uh, it, it's, in, it, it, it's interesting that, you know, he, uh, he developed these relationships with people and uh, to him, you know, he was, he was always Lee. You know, he was always Lee. He wasn't, you know, and, and he, he became this very in, international star and, and to him, he was just always, just always Lee. And, okay. and that's, I think that says a lot about both my father and, and Lee Trevino at the same time. So of I, course, I, yeah. of course, yeah. but 
some fun stories. But uh, so yeah, Jack Nicholas and you would uh, you would want to play around as Jack Nichols and you would want to beat Phil Mickelson. Nice. Yeah, just because like I said, the banter I think is cool. Like, you know, when you pick Lee, that was about he- yeah. hearing hearing him do his thing when he's on the oh, course, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember he uh, played in this senior tour skins game and he uh, played like the entire back nine and he every tee shot he did, he would mimic other famous golfers. And it was just the funniest thing I ever seen. Like he did Ray, when he did Ray Floyd, Raymond Floyd, I nearly just fell out of my chair. And, and it's funny because my introduction to golf, like I grew up watching, my dad watched a lot of golf when I was a kid and I grew up idolizing players who had well passed their prime. I grew up idolizing Lee Trevino, Arnold Palmer, mm-hmm. Jack Nicholas, mm-hmm. and, um, these these kids now they're old men <laughs> fred couples greg norman right of course like they they were just like you know like they they couldn't to me in my heart and my mind they couldn't hold a candle to these guys um and it took it took the resurgence of tiger woods for me to actually appreciate the regular tour you know gotcha as it as it as it, as it ultimately became and you know i mean but how could you not love Freddie Boom Boom? You know, like how could you yeah. not love who that guy was? And and Ray Floyd with that with the leg movement. You know, Ray the Floyd. The leg movement. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's the invitation that he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that 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 left right movement. But and Ray Floyd was a local. You know, he lived in in Miami. Ray mm-hmm. Floyd was a local guy down here. So he was a, you know, he was iconic down here. But yeah, I mean, you you know, you're talking about people that were they were iconic by the time you started enjoying them, you know, like the people that you knew mm-hmm. were already iconic in the industry. Yeah. So when well, like well past good. their prime too. like, I mean, just, you know, it, and you know, if you analyze their game, probably, sh- you know, shells of their former self, you know, um, but still just incredible. I, I remember uh, when John Daly won his PGA championship, he was paired, uh, he was paired. It was either the second or third round. I can't remember. Jack Nicholas was still playing at a high level. He was paired with Jack Nicholas at one point. And it was really interesting as John Daly was walking down fairways and he was just dominating this tournament, just crushing it. Right. And he is just sitting there like every time Jack Nicholas is teeing off, he's just staring at him. Like with just this, this, this childlike awe. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, and I remember that. And I, and, you know, Daly certainly had his, demons obviously well documented over the years and everything but you know for a professional golfer to 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 hold to to hold someone in that high esteem and to not be distracted to be distracted but to not be distracted enough to achieve an ultimate goal like winning a major uh, that that to me was pretty one of the most it seems seems weird considering the amazing performances we've seen over the years to me that was one of the most amazing performances uh, yeah. on the golf course you know i've i've uh i've been fortunate enough to meet mr nicholas a few times um oh my goodness oh wow yeah what an honor uh, yeah no i mean and he is as kind and and nice as he appears to be when he's on television and he actually is That's in some way even nicer oh wow he, most of the golf that he plays now is all for charity he'll show up at charity tournaments and help out to raise money and do all those things. And he really is an amazing guy. We actually, we talked about a course in Texas that he had designed uh, out in Houston called Lock and Bar. Ooh. So I was out in Lock and Bar. I played there. Nicholas went back and redid it. It was one of the first courses he had designed and, and he had redone the course. I went back and played it again. And then I saw him the following year. And uh, we had a conversation about lock and bar and he was, he was just like a normal person, normal guy. So he respect there. Yeah. He's, he's been the architect for some really amazing um, um, courses, course designing. And yeah, it, and um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, he's, Jack Jack Nicholas is is still probably I mean, I mean, he's right there, right underneath Lee Trevino for me. 
Um, so it was really, I, I smiled when you said Jack Nicholas, uh, when I asked that question, cause I was like, yeah, the golden bear was, uh, I mean, just incredible. Arnold, Arnold Palmer's another one. Um, yeah. the, those guys, I mean, just, uh, unbelievable. I, 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 I really did. I literally wept when Arnold Palmer passed away. Cause it just, it so did I, sad. So did I. yeah. And, the, and actually, um, we had played, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but, uh, you know, he's from Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, Arnold and so we we had played um, his kind of home course ended up being um, uh, Laurel Valley I don't know if you know that but we had played Laurel Valley on that Sunday I was out there playing Laurel Valley I played Oakmont and Laurel Valley oh wow and yeah we played Laurel Valley and the the, the gentleman who got us on was the doctor that Arnold Palmer was seeing the next day and he had passed preparing for the surgery that that doctor was going to do oh geez wow. yeah so it was very it was very personal because we had literally just we were just up there and we had just played that course we just played the drove and actually uh, i'm sorry uh, laurel valley and actually this year we went back and we played arnold palmer's course where he grew up where his father was the general manager of the course that was the <laughs> drove the drove country club so i just played that a few months ago pretty amazing That's that's awesome. You know, in that old locker room where Arnold was and just like to walk through it, it was, uh, it was very special. It's very cool. Yeah. Well, and again, I can't thank you enough for tonight. What an incredible uh, couple hours it's been sitting and chatting with you um, about your story and, um, and the first 25, as you, as you put it. First 25. So, Really excited for the really excited for the next 25 excited to be a part of it and uh, uh, excited for uh, all of our guests, uh, all of our, excuse me, all of our uh, audience who got to experience um, our amazing guests tonight. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. For all of the likes, shares and comments. We really appreciate that. As always, you can tune into LOS from our takes on our live on our Facebook page every Sunday. Uh, if you catch us later, you can always catch us on YouTube on the Yellows from our page. Don't forget to like, uh, download, subscribe, and review. The same thing on our Facebook page. If you're catching us on podcasts later on as well, wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Google Play, Podbean, or iHeartRadio, or wherever you happen to listen to podcasts, be sure you download, subscribe, and review. If you already are a subscriber, I always encourage you to go ahead and unsubscribe, but please, please, please don't forget to resubscribe because that really helps my numbers so I can continue to get amazing guests like our esteemed guest this evening, uh, Mr. Alan Rubin. Um, we appreciate it, everyone. This was our 148th take. I've done 148 of these. It's been wow. incredible. And uh, really excited for the slate of upcoming guests. Next week will be uh, Casey Johnson and Dan Welsh of Surrogates, Latelier, and Tatuaje Brands, of course. And our 150th take, we mentioned him a couple times tonight, Nick Perdomo will be our 150th take. And 2021, we'll get started with our top 10 cigars of 2020. You don't want to miss that. As well as upcoming guests coming into the new year, stay tuned on our Facebook page. We'll be having those coming uh, forthcoming. And we do appreciate every single last one of you. So everyone out there, we do appreciate for our everyone. I'm Barry Duplissy, live from the HF Barcelona studios of Euless, Texas. This was our 148th take. Guess what, everyone? See you next time. <laughs>